It all began on Jane Goodall's front porch in Tanzania, when a group of students told her that they felt powerless, thinking about the problems around them. She encouraged them to use their voices and ideas to address the issues they saw head on. Roots and Shoots was born. Now, Roots and Shoots is a worldwide movement of thousands of passionate young people making big impact and it's growing. Whether it's natural disasters, homelessness, pollution or even climate change, Roots and Shoots youth are taking on challenges in creating real positive change across the globe. Youth aren't just our future, they are our present and they're changing the world today. Hello and welcome everyone to the Jane Goodall Institute's Roots and Shoots National Youth Leadership Council's 2021 Summit. We are so happy to have you here and to share with you some incredible examples of young people inspiring hope through action. I'm Anna Rathman and I have the great honor of being the executive director of the Jane Goodall Institute here in the US. At the Jane Goodall Institute, we talk a lot about hope. Jane talks a lot about hope. We talk about the power of hope. We talk about the importance of hope. We talk about how hope can inspire individuals and bring together communities to combat some of the greatest challenges facing us today. And you, Roots and Shootsers, are an example of this hope. Through your actions, 
through your leadership and through your unwavering belief in a brighter future, you give us all hope. So thank you for that. Thank you to all of you who are joining us today. We have people from all over the United States, all over the world, family, friends, um, fellow Roots and Shootsters. Thank you also to our supporters and donors through whose generosity Roots and Shoots has been inspiring, empowering, and supporting young leaders, thousands of young leaders all over the world for the last 30 years. Without you, truly, this would not be possible. Thank you. And as we look ahead to the next 30 years of Roots and Shoots, I can say that all of us at the Jane Goodall Institute could not be more hopeful for what's ahead. So thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to start off today with Abby A. She's going to lead us off and share with us a little bit about her work through Roots and Shoots. And Abby, I know it's always a little tough being the first one out of the shoot. And I wanna acknowledge that and thank you for, for your willingness to do that. And we look forward to hearing um, what you have to say. So please take it away, Abby. Thank you, good morning. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. All right, hello everyone. Have you ever loved something so deeply that it brings you to happy tears just thinking about it? My name is Abby, um, as I said before, and I've been a Roots and Shoots member for seven years, and I joined the NYLC six years ago. I've come of age and grown through this really life-changing program um, from age 13 to age 20 now, and after overcoming a battle, um, a really tough battle with Lyme disease, I came to Roots and Shoots bursting with passion for service. And Dr. Jane and Roots and Shoots really helped me find my direction for how to utilize this passion to create positive change in my community. And actually, I received my acceptance letter to the NYLC um, just before another Lyme doctor visit. And I can really vividly recall sitting in the doctor's office, um, receiving treatment and trying to contain my excitement, not very successfully. Um, today, many thanks to Roots and Shoots and the NYLC. I'm a college senior um, beginning her first steps towards a career in the world of community engagement for environmental causes. There isn't enough time to fully cover everything on this slide, and I know there's a lot, um, and on the next one as well, but I really included all of this just to give a visual of how much I've gained as a youth leader through this program. Um, this is the story of how the NYLC prepared me um, to go forward in my life's journey um, to truly make a difference in the world for the things that I care so deeply about. And um, because it would take a long time to share my journey through projects and experiences chronologically um, within six minutes, um, I chose to tell my story in some of the most impactful lessons that I have learned um, through all of these opportunities. So lesson one, lead with your heart wide open. When I joined Roots and Shoots, um, I didn't actually have a formal route started. So um, my first projects, such as um, planting milkweed for monarch butterflies and collecting donations of menstrual hygiene products for my local food pantry, um, they were organized kind of with me as an individual and my family helped me. Um, but then a little ways down the road, I created a litter prevention project called Keep Rehoboth Beautiful. And I ended up working with a group of people on this project. Um, we actually formed a town committee um, and I quickly had to learn these lessons on the slide. Um, communicate clearly and in a way that helps the group effectively reach a shared goal. Um, be accountable for your actions, um, the good ones, and any mistakes that you make. Um, choose courage and lead with a wide open heart full of love. I really learned to be willing to learn from others, especially as a leader, um, because a leader is a part of a group. Um, as I learned, and um, leaders aren't really meant to be, you know, giving orders from the top of a pyramid or on top of a pedestal. Lesson two, be open-minded. On the NYLC and in our communities, um, we meet people from all different backgrounds. And 
I really learned um, over the years um, through my involvement with projects and the NYLC and Roots and Shoots um, to set any judgments and assumptions um, about someone aside until I truly get to know them. Um, I've learned through all of these experiences with different projects and meeting guest speakers and people from all over the country on the council um, that everyone has a truly remarkable story to tell. And so I learned not to close a door just because someone is on a different path or a different timeline than I might be expecting. Lesson three, take healthy risks. I believe that my life's purpose um, is actually one of service. Um, when I was trying to pick a career, that's the only thing I could think of. Um, and Roots and Shoots has really given me the tools and the resources to um, be of service to the causes that I care the most about. Um, several NYLC guest speakers over the years gave the advice on this slide, and I wrote it down because it really stuck with me and impacted me. Um, when I began college, I had to pick a major and start planning my career path. And like I said, all I knew was that I wanted to do service work. I was so passionate about my roots and shoots projects. Um, and that's really all I could think of wanting to do for the rest of my life um, at that moment in time and still now, and um, particularly for the environment. But I just really didn't know how to make community service and activism a career right out of college. So I kept reflecting on all of the lessons that I've learned through my experience here. Um, and I followed the inspiration of Dr. Jane and of Roots and Shoots members all over the world who work really super hard to make sure that their dreams come true. And I also had conversations with Hope Martinez, who's the NYLC manager, and NYLC members from the past and um, who current NYLC members and they really encouraged me to believe in myself and to follow my heart. And they also gave me a lot of tools and resources to carve out the right academic and career path um, for me and my goals. Um, because of the guidance and the relationships and the love and the support um, and the resources that I've gained through this program, um, Roots and Shoots and the NYLC, I am now entering my senior year of college as an environmental studies and sociology double major. And um, I'm about to begin a dream job, at least a dream job for me, um, working at an organization called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, which advocates for nature-based solutions to climate change. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, or actually last year at the summit, the virtual summit, we had guest speaker of Bill Wallower, who's a JGI photographer, um, an excellent person overall, um, said this quote, and it really stuck with me, just like the quotes on the other sides. He said, thank the people who are doing the good things. And as I was creating this presentation, thinking about what I wanted to say, um, I it just really hit me how much um, Roots and Shoots and the NYLC have played such a huge role in where I am today in my life. Um, and as I'm about to graduate college and go out into the world and um, every single day I wake up and I am so inspired by the work that Roots and Shoots members do and the work that all of the NYLC members who are about to speak today do. Um, so I wanted to say um, thank you to all of the Roots and Shoots members out there and to all of the NYLC members um, for the work that you're doing in your communities to make the world a better place for people, animals, and the environment. Thank you. Wow, Abby, great job. That was terrific. I, I loved how you talked about having an open mind and an open heart. And so much of that is part of the roots and shoots process of identifying um, things that you want to get involved in, but then going in with an open mind and an open heart and looking for solutions and working together. And then the element of thanking. I loved that you brought that in and thank you for the good things that you are doing and the rest of the roots and shootsers out there. So thank you, Abby. Um, next, we're gonna move on to Caleb. Caleb, you're up next. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So, so this is my presentation. Uh, let me, hi, I'm Caleb. Uh, a little bit about myself. I run the nonprofit organization Kid Changemakers. Uh, I'm a rising junior, and this is my first year on the NYLC. Uh, to give you a sense of 
my interests. Those are a few of my favorite, my favorite book, my favorite painting, favorite song, favorite font. Um, how I got started. Uh, when I was a young elementary school student, I read a biography on the life of Dr. Jane Goodall, and I was deeply touched by Dr. Goodall's philanthropic organization, Roots and Shoots, and was motivated to follow in her inspirational footsteps. Uh, I started with a really small project, and it was cutting coupons on the weekends for service men and service women stationed at a U.S. military base in Okinawa. Uh, as I grew up, my projects evolved and got bigger. Uh, the first endeavor with other youth was donating leftovers from school parties to a local food shelter. Oh, no, not a food shelter, sorry, a food pantry. Uh, I then worked on lunch packing and a few assorted projects in elementary school. And it was at that point I decided to create my own organization, Kid Change Makers. And I wrote a mission statement down when I was younger, and it was to collaborate with businesses, schools, and other organizations to uh, serve the foster youth homeless and food insecure in my community and beyond while providing service opportunities with uh, for youth leaders. And I think that's really why this uh, Roots and Shoots stuck out to me because the uh, intent was there. And I expanded my scope in middle school to include victims of natural and human-made disasters. And it was at, at that point, I began collaborating with my school and my county to broaden my impact. Uh, some projects I did were a drive for Hurricane Harvey, where we provided um, school supplies and food and toiletries. And then there was drives for government shutdowns. Uh, I live in Maryland, close to DC, and there's a lot of government workers. So a few years ago when there was a lot of government shutdowns, a lot of families were struggling. So we uh, got a couple schools to donate diapers, toiletries, and a little bit of food. Um, and recently I've been doing menstrual inequality initiatives, providing tampons, pads, and dispensers in schools and distributing them through uh, community drives. And as I learned more about service, I found my real motivation. And that's that if I have the ability and time, I feel an obligation to make the world a, just a little bit better. And I think a really neat thing about that is everyone has the ability to make a huge impact in the world. And uh, it's wonderful seeing NYLC members do that. And it just gives hope for a brighter future. So a little bit about present day me. Uh, there's two main projects I work on. I uh, established a meal swipe program at Bowie State University, which is essentially a virtual hot meal pantry that can be that students can donate to, parents can donate to, teachers can donate to, and outside donors can donate to. And um, because of COVID, there's a lot of more, there's ways to get creative with uh, projects. And I've hopped on to a couple of pop-up pantries where I provide volunteers, uh, diapers, menstrual products, and more. And I wanted to touch on a couple of projects I want to, I mean, either in the beginning stages of working on, or I hope to integrate into the future. Uh, the first is eradicating the diaper tax in Maryland uh, through state legislation. And that's really important because I've seen firsthand how many families struggle with buying diapers and the diaper poverty in our communities. And another project is applying machine learning to service. Uh, I intern at uh, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory where I've studied a lot of machine learning and I'm really interested in applying a lot of STEM knowledge to uh, my service and other service. And to go on with that, being in the NYLC has inspired me to uh, start environmental initiatives related to my current work. And I've looked into community gardens and providing fresh produce for local pantries. Uh, thank you. That's my presentation. Caleb, great job. Um, I couldn't help but think as you were talking about your current um, roles and applying machine learning to roots and shoots and just to think about roots and shoots of where it's come and where all of you are taking it into the future. It's extraordinary. So well done. Um, congratulations on all of your work and, and keep it up. 
Um, next up will be April, April Z. Would you mind sharing with us your projects and your work? Yeah, of course. Um, give me a second. Let me pull up my presentation. Um, let's see. Are you guys able to see my screen? Looks like it's coming through that you started. Um, can you see my presentation? Or... Yes. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Great. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, hi everyone. My name is April. Um, this is my. This is going to be my the end of my third year on the council, um, and my fifth year with Roots and Shoots. Um, today, I'll talk a little bit about um, what I've been up to this past year, and I'm just super excited to be here today with you guys. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona. Um, and this fall, I'm actually gonna be a freshman at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm gonna major in electrical engineering and comp sci. Uh, go Bears. Um, I have two dogs. And then on the right side is just a picture of me and my sister. Um, I play the piano. And then a little fun fact, I've been a lacto-vegetarian for almost seven years now. Um, and that picture is just a vegan chocolate cake um, that I baked. Okay, so moving on to the initiatives that I've been involved in. Um, if you were here last year, um, you probably remembered when I talked a little, a little bit about um, Notes of Hope Youth. So Notes of Hope Youth is a student-led uh, music performance group that's really dedicated to combating senior isolation that's kind of risen um, during the time of the pandemic, right? Um, and to do this, we uh, host recitals. Um, during the pandemic, it was online, but now we're kind of transitioning to more of an in-person uh, kind of scenario. So we host those recitals and we also maintain a YouTube channel um, as well as collaborate with other artists um, and NGOs in the larger Tucson area. Um, because I'm transitioning to college this summer, um, I've kind of transferred a lot of the leadership roles uh, to my younger sister, Hannah, um, and I've taken on more of a senior advisory role. Um, so Hannah will talk more about our progress and Rizal specifics in her presentation later. Uh, so make sure to look forward to that. Um, in terms of my role, I just make monitor recitals, um, make sure they run smoothly. Um, I also work with things like designing promotional content, um, like little bookmarks uh, with our information on them uh, to hand out to the seniors um, and then contribute to website content as well. So here um, on the left side is just a snapshot of like Kind of our impact that we've gotten with our YouTube channel, um, and it's just really exciting to see how um, how we've kind of grown. Okay, so moving on to kind of school-related projects. Um, so last fall, I helped lead the Desert Harmony Roots and Shoots Club, and one of the projects that I led was a composting project. Um, so in this project, I compiled a bunch of information about composting specifically for the desert because, you know, there are a little bit more like technical difficulties um, with less moisture in the air. Um, and so this project was really fulfilling because uh, many of our club members kind of, you know, went home with that excitement, and that, you know, that spark in their eyes, um, having been given this new information um, and a challenge to, you know, make a difference, um, even if it is just in their own home or doing something as simple as composting. And then again, Hannah will talk a little bit more about our club projects um, in her presentation later. Okay, so this year um, I've also been involved with another student-led NGO called STEM Chats. Um, so STEM Chats is really on a mission to help shatter barriers um, in the STEM field uh, by providing a transformative peer-to-peer -peer education for all students. Um, so, you know, we kind of try to help um, bring those opportunities to, you know, first generation, low income, minority, um, uh, underprivileged students. So with STEM Chats, uh, my role there is a, a program coordinator on the Blueprint team. And so the Blueprint team is uh, a high school research journal. So we have um, one publication uh, each year, and then we also have kind of like a special edition um, program publication as well. So this summer, one of the things that I've really worked on is mentoring a lot of these, uh, you know, first generation low income minority students with their research projects. Um, and this is something I really love personally, because, um, you know, I am really passionate about research in STEM. Um, 
and so I love being able to kind of, you know, give advice to students, um, you know, who I used to be in their shoes, like, you know, two years ago. Um, and then just giving them advice on the process um, and tips because, you know, when you first approach research as a high schooler, it is pretty intimidating, um, as well as just, you know, general, general advice on college applications and other things like that. Um, I think it's just really exciting to see how the students, you know, start off with an idea, something that they've uh, brainstormed, and then um, see like how far they can take the idea and then turn that into kind of like uh, an abstract even. So here, um, these are some pictures of uh, my research that was featured in our journal. Um, so this is past research I conducted, uh, which was designing a gray water filtration system uh, for single households to help combat water scarcity. Um, and if any of the council members are interested um, or audience watching live, if you guys uh, you know, are a high schooler or have you know, research that you're proud of and want to um, you know, kind of celebrate and would like to publish, um, you know, always be sure to reach out to me um, and then I'll like, you know, get you that information. Okay, so even though it might, seems like, uh, it might seem like a lot of the things I presented on don't directly relate to Roots and Shoots, um, this program is really like at the core of many of my activities. Um, so even in my research, right, um, I'm really passionate about, you know, environmental engineering um, and then just like research in STEM in general, right? And so I've kind of found a way to um, intertwine that with outreach um, uh, via, you know, STEM chats and mentoring other students. Um, and then Roots and Shoots and Dr. Jane and my fellow council peers have really, you know, provided me so many opportunities, uh, support, and just inspiration throughout my high school career um, and beyond. Um, and overall, I'm just really grateful to be a part of this program um, because I've learned to develop so many new skills that I know I will use throughout my lifetime. Uh, so thank you uh, for taking the time today to listen to my presentation. Um, again, thank you to all the Roots and Shoots members out there. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll just, um, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, April. That was wonderful. Um, I loved hearing you talk about the role of outreach and membership too in your work and your focus and, and thinking about those who can really benefit from the skills and the talents of um, all of the Roots and Shootsers. So thank you for that. Um, great job, great work, and so excited to continue to watch um, what amazing things you're going to do in the future. So well done. Um, next up, we have Yo-Yo. Looking forward to hearing your work and your project. So take it away. Thank you. Um, okay. Hello, my name is Yo-Yo, and I am a rising sophomore in Carmel Valley, San Diego, and this is my first year in the NYLC and second year in Roots and Shoots. I'm going to be talking about some fun facts about me and then three of my favorite projects. Um, I have two pets, my dog and my cat. My dog's name is Carmel, and he is four years old, and I adopted him from the Helen Woodward Animal Center, and my cat's name is Snowy, and she, I adopted her from MSPCA in Boston and she is six years old. And I also have a sister who is seven years older than. Um, I've been fostering kittens and bunnies for two years um, and mainly neonate kittens. And so most of them are very, very young. So I have to bottle feed them and stimulate them and help them walk around. And recently I became a foster ambassador at the San Diego Humane Society. And I was given the role to promote these bunnies on social media. Um, their names are Gray and Finn, they're brothers. And I posted videos of them um, walking around and eating. And I got a total of over 2000 views and they were happily together adopted. One of my, my first project when I joined the NYLC was called Music for Peace. And in this project, I uploaded videos of myself performing the Japanese harp, which is called Koto 
onto YouTube in order to promote peace. Um, and I've been playing this harp for 10 years. And it is, the koto is a 13 string zither instrument that was derived from a Chinese, from a Chinese harp. And it represents a dragon. It was also played by many aristocrats a long time ago in Japan. I often perform with my sister in live performances and also in my videos. My most recent project is called Passion for Your Fruits. And these are the passion fruits I have in my backyard. Um, I have two goals in this project. My first goal is to bake desserts with these passion fruits and donate them to women's shelter. Um, and a week and a half ago, I donated five batches of coconut passion fruit banana breads and um, to the Rachel's Women's Center. And Erica here told me that before COVID, there were 100 to 140 women visiting per day, but due to social distancing protocols and because the government opened more shelters, there are now 30 to 60 women visiting this particular shelter per day. This is a zoomed out picture of my passion for treat. And so my second goal in this project is to bring more pollinators to my backyard and around my neighborhood. Um, pollen, insects and other pollinators are really important because they are necessary for the healthy growth of all plants and so therefore humans and animals in the environment. And um, lately I've seen so many more bees and birds and butterflies and insects and it it's really cool. Thank you for listening. Yo, yo. Oh, my goodness. We've got kittens. We've got bunnies. You've got banana bread and pollinators. I love it. All of it. So amazing. So great the way that you're able to connect the dots. On, on all of those things and really makes some positive impacts through your work. So well done, loved um, loved the, the photos of the kittens and the bunnies, pretty darn cute there. So great work and looking forward to hearing more um, about your work in the future. Next up, Charlotte, we've got you up, take it away. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. So, hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm a rising senior in the central Jersey area, and this is my first year on the NYLC. And I'm just super excited to be here. It's been a wonderful experience so far, and I'm just incredibly grateful to be working with Roots and Shoots and to be on the NYLC. Just a little bit about me. I love being outdoors. I really like hiking and bird watching. Other than that, I also play field hockey and I've been doing Kung Fu for a while now as well. I've always loved animals. My family recently took in a flock of chickens and ducks. A lot of them were actually adopted from people who got ducklings or chicks over quarantine but couldn't take care of them anymore. So we've been taking in a good number of them recently. So just getting into some of the work that I've done, something that I'm really passionate about is birds and bird watching. The conservation of birds is important because they're a crucial part of many ecosystems and as such, they're an important tool for ecologists in measuring the health of various ecosystems. In terms of bird watching, other than just being fun, I think that it brings a lot of value in allowing us to slow down and pay closer attention to the nuances of nature because birds don't live in isolation. So each species interacts with the numerous other organisms and elements of the non-living world, such as geological formations and weather systems. So I think that you can really begin to understand the interconnections among all of these things in nature by observing birds. 
So in an effort to get more youth involved with birds, I started a project with my brother called Light as a Feather. So every week we'll go out with a group of people to discuss topics relating to ornithology. We'll go on bird watching trips and we've also done a few projects. So I have two of my two projects that I think are my favorite. The first one is a bluebird monitoring program that we did with the Mercer County Park Commission. So just a little bit of background on bluebirds. They were on the brink of extinction a few decades ago, and they've kind of been a comeback species through the efforts of scientists and environmentalists. And they're often used as a measure of ecological stability in parks and preserve across New Jersey. So what we did was every week we go out, we'd go out with a group of people to monitor the nest boxes um, set up at the park. So we'd log down things like clutch size, number of nestlings, and invasive species. And this data would be reported to the Mercer County Park Commission, whose teams, whose team of ecologists use the data to assess the current ecological health of the park and plan future actions. It's been absolutely fascinating to observe the progression of birds from young nestlings to fully fledged adults, as well as to explore the positive impact of bluebird boxes um, that they've had on the native population. The pictures on the two circles right here are just a picture of one of the nests that we monitored, if anyone was curious. Another project that we've done is a skin study program that my brother and I started with the Plainsboro Preserve, which is a preserve under the National Audubon Society. For anyone that, that doesn't know, skin studies are a method of preserving birds, kind of like taxidermy, but the end goal is not to create a lifelike structure, but rather to preserve them in a way that is accessible for scientists, um, and they're usually used for research and education purposes. I was initially inspired to start this project because I actually created a, um, a few study skins with a naturalist at the preserve a few years ago. And it was just super cool being able to see the birds up close. Um, recently, there's also been a lot of birds piling up in the freezer um, at the preserve from people who found them on the side of the road, usually from window or car crashes, which is sad. But the, one of the reasons why we do these study skins is to kind of give these birds a new life in a sense. So in the past few months, we've been going out every weekend to the preserve for a few hours to create the study skins. Um, we're really lucky to have a naturalist on site who's been doing it for almost 30 years now. And it's just been really wonderful having her there as a mentor and guiding us through the process of creating the study skins. Finished birds will either be used for research or education at the visitor center at the preserve. This picture right here is just a picture of the current collection that we have at the preserve. Overall, it's just been really cool getting to examine the birds up close, and it's also really heartwarming to preserve. Another project that I've done is called Terra by Charlotte. This is unrelated to birds, but two years ago, I started selling stickers in an effort to merge art and nature. So a lot of the stickers are inspired by aspects of nature. This picture right here is a picture of a recent collection called Field Notes, which was inspired by the local New Jersey wildlife. So it's kind of got this like field journal-y, science-y feel to it, and it's gotten a lot of positive feedback so far. All of the profits from the stickers go towards uplifting indigenous voices and climate action through an organization called the IWGIA. The reason why I chose this organization is because Indigenous people possess a wealth of knowledge concerning the environment, and I think that they've really mastered the reciprocal relationship that we have with the environment. So I believe that it's incredibly important to include them in climate related conversations moving forward. Thank you. Got it. Fantastic, fantastic, Charlotte. I love too your project um, that you were talking a little bit about of merging science and the natural world with art. And we all know what a beautiful pairing that can be. So well done on that. Also, I couldn't help but think about this narrative of hope that we talk a lot about and the role of the bluebirds and the bluebird study and, and how they have, have come back from the brink of extinction and, and are flourishing and, and what hope that can give us. So great work, well done. Thank you for, for sharing with all of us. Next up, we have Ayushi. Are you there? There she is. All right, I'll let you take it away. Looking forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? It's coming on. We just there we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ayushi. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and this is my first year on the NYLC. So I'm really excited to be here with you all today. So a little bit about me. I love to dance. I spend most of my time outside of school at my ballet studio here in Memphis. And along with dance, I also love creating visual art. I'm very passionate about wildlife conservation and our earth in general. So most of my projects focus on combating negative effects of climate change and exploring solutions. So I started Conserve Action Project, my main Roots and Shoots project, to highlight the intersections of the creative arts with the environmental movement and to provide a space for all people to show their work. It's also a virtual space where both youth and adults can find easily accessible resources to take action for environmental causes that they believe in. I love this project because I get to see some of my main passions, the creative arts and the environmental movement merge together. And I love seeing the creativity of everyone who participates and learning about learning more about all the issues that they care about. So here are some example submissions um, that are in the online collection. I've had submissions from all over the country and actually some from Luxembourg and Australia. So it's been really cool to see the reach um, beyond just my community. Climate change is such a complex issue and there's so much research and information being circulated around the scientific and academic community among people who at least on a basic level, agree on the urgency of taking action for our planet. And I think that a great way to make this information more accessible and personal is through art, because it's something that everyone can see and everyone can create. Each piece um, in the online collection on my website has an artist statement that can explain the inspiration for the work and the scientific data or environmental issue that it's focused on. So under the resources page on my website, you can find some of the more action-based projects or campaigns that you can participate in. So the Palm Oil Action Challenge is an ongoing project that people can participate in anytime from wherever they are. The challenge is broken down into six parts, which you can see on the slide here. Participants start by learning about the negative effects of the palm oil industry and move to guided activities or actions that I've put together, like assessing one's purchases, making an individual commitment and signing petitions, and contacting companies with the help of a letter template that I've created. On the last day of the challenge, participants will work on a creative piece focused on something meaningful that they have learned about the palm oil industry throughout the challenge. So deforestation from palm oil plantations is uh, clearly affecting our planet and those who inhabit it negatively. So action must be taken soon. I created the challenge as a way for people who don't necessarily know what actions to take or what to start with to find easily accessible resources and get involved in working towards a more sustainable future for the industry. So my Earth Day project this year was centered around the meat and dairy industry and working towards more plant-based diets. Like the palm oil challenge, all components are online so people can participate in this from wherever they are at any time. This challenge was broken down into three parts, create, take action, and commit, and I created an interactive slide deck for each section. Participants began with an overview of the 1.5 degree line for global warming and work on a creative piece that explores an effect of climate change. They then continue with the impact of the meat and dairy industry um, on the planet, and then they make a plan with ways that they can incorporate more plant-based foods into their meals. So this is a clip from an example creative piece I did for the Earth Day Challenge. 
This dance was inspired by 2019 IUCN data that showed that over half of the world's endangered species and almost all critically endangered species could be lost within a century. I used transition effects between the clips to show the passage of time and the movements get increasingly faster towards the end of the dance to represent a race against human activity causing a sixth mass extinction. I'm showing this piece now just to demonstrate how environmental issues can be communicated in so many different ways and that the submissions for my project aren't just limited to visual art. The last project I'm going to talk about today is my World Chimpanzee Day fundraiser, which is actually still going on right now. I'm selling t-shirts and tote bags with my chimpanzee illustration on them to raise money for the Jane Goodall Institute to support their important work preserving chimpanzee habitats and empowering people to make a difference for their communities and the natural world. So here I have listed, once the slide loads, I listed my project's website URL and the contact information for both me and my project, if anyone is interested. There it is. But that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for listening. Ayushi, that was phenomenal. Wonderful job. And again, I loved how you were showing that art can be used to communicate some of these issues around climate change, around um, nature and, and finding solutions. So well done on that. Also, thank you for um, your art, sharing your art as a means of raising funds um, for the Jane Goodall Institute. That is just absolutely brilliant and so appreciate that. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Daniel. Daniel, could you take it away? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm gonna share my screen yes. first. All right. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Looks great. Thank you. Okay, so hi, my name is Daniel. This is my third year on the Roots and Shoots Council. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so this year's project I did on mushrooms, and I'm actually gonna try and show you guys how mushrooms can change the world. So what's my project? This is how it works. I grow mushrooms in my garden, and I grow mushrooms in my community's garden. And we come together and we, uh, we you know, create this amazing, creation in the ground and it changed the world. It's, it's that easy. So how it works. I started, I hand built my, uh, I hand built my raised bed, but with wood, I built it with my friend, Alistair, who's a master woodworker. I love that guy. Amazing. He helped so much and he helped build my community's garden as well. So he's a great guy. And then I created a natural cycle to, uh, just ensure that the mushrooms grow to the best of their abilities. And then I planted the garden giant spores, which, a spore is kind of like a root of a tree. It's what you put, you plant, and then the mushroom then grows. And you have this amazing fungi in your own garden. Now, what does it do? It does a lot, actually. So once you get started, you can get your neighbors involved. That's what I did. So I was like, well, I have all these great mushrooms, but I have this community around me. And we did have a garden, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really as special as it could have been. So, and I was actually divided from my neighbors. I didn't really have a great relationship, but I I went to their doors. I was like, hey, what's up? I'm Daniel. I live up the street. I've lived here for like 17 years. Um, what's up? And they're like, hey, hey. I was like, hey, let's let's plant mushrooms together. They're like, all right, let's do this. And so I actually got them to work together and we all planted mushrooms. And it was incredible. And we now we actually, when the mushrooms grow, we pick them and cook them. And we have cookouts with all the neighbors. And it's just like, it's really, it's actually a dream. It's pretty amazing. And it does so much for the environment, not just us. It does so much. We used to have deer and raccoons and all these animals and they left because in another neighborhood close by, they're doing lots of construction and they were, we all live in pretty small homes and they were tearing down the small homes and building bigger homes. And so the animals are like construction, dude, I am out, but we planted the mushrooms and it actually made them come back and they could, when the mushrooms die, they go into the soil and they actually can create plants that you didn't even plant. They can grow and there's literal plants that you didn't plant. They just come up and these animals feed on them. And now there are deer in our backyards and it is just, it's amazing. So the big picture, it does all this stuff for your neighborhood. It does all this stuff for your community, but what does it do for the world around us? So it does three incredibly amazing things. It ends the bee colony collapse, which basically um, gives us food. It turns oil spills, dead zones, which is probably one of the worst things that could happen. It turns them into a healthy ecosystem and it's as well as medicine. So 
it can literally <laughs> change an oil spill. It's pretty amazing. So let's talk about bees first. Um, so bees are used to pollinate plants. So for instance, almonds, and when they're trucked in between almond fields to pollinate, they're fed sugar water. That's what the farmers feed them. Now, sugar water has zero nutrients. In fact, I'd say it has negative nutrients and it really affects these bees ecosystems and they get sick and they can get gnats and they can even die and they can't pollinate naturally. And it's just really bad for them. So this man named Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets is the maestro of mushrooms. This guy's a genius. He's an absolute angel. This guy's amazing. I've met him a couple of times. He's a fabulous guy. He's just amazing. And so he discovered that when a bear scratches a tree, sap, comes from the tree naturally. Now the tree does die, but what ends up happening is a mushroom go grows from that dead tree because really what a mushroom is, is it's life being born from death. That's kind of its magic. When something dies, mushrooms grow and it recreates life. So these bees that weren't in captivity would fly and they would, they would uh, eat the sap and they would eat the mushrooms and it actually was making them stronger. He's like, well, I'm gonna take this to these sick bees that I'm hearing about at these farms and he gave it to the guys who were like, no, we're not trying this. And he's like, come on, just try it, just try it. Come on, you can do it. And these farmers didn't want to do it. And they actually tried it. They ended up trying it and their bees were cured and they didn't have to feed them sugar water. And these bees were naturally pollinating their crops. And it was magical. Now, oil spills. These are oil spills are pretty horrible, as you can see. Don't worry. Mushrooms got it. Mushrooms got it covered. Oil spills. Do you think they're bad? No, mushrooms are there. Mushrooms got it. They got the job done. So again, Paul Stamets, genius. He found out, he went to this research place where they had oil spills and they were studying, well, how can we get rid of these? How can we get rid of the chemicals from the oil? Because what I know I forget is that oil is actually from the earth. It's a natural thing. But what is not good is when you have oil chemicals and that's in the chemicals. So what he did, all these people tried different experiments. How can we get rid of this oil? Paul came and he planted mushrooms over the oil, came back six weeks later, no chemicals, 95% were gone. It was incredible. And plants had grown and there were actual birds and this dead zone had become a life zone and plants started to grow that he didn't even plant. And these people were like, whoa, that's insane. And he did it and it was amazing and it just worked magically. Now it saves lives. It doesn't just, doesn't just help the environment, it helps humans. So Paul had, his mother had stage four breast cancer which is horrible. And the doctor said she had three months to live and she was taking these two drugs called Taxol and Herceptum, which were kind of working because, you know, they weren't, they weren't not hurting, but she still was going to pass away. And she had such serious cancer that those weren't going to work. So she's talking to the doctor and she goes, you know, um, he goes, you know, check this out. They're doing this study where they're actually giving people with breast cancer mushrooms. She's like, mushrooms? He's like, yeah, this is the study. She goes, my son, Paul, supplies the mushrooms for the study. The doctor goes, what, your son? She goes, yeah, he supplies them. So she went to him. She started taking the turkey tail mushrooms four times at night, four times in the morning, and her tumors were gone, and she lived another 10 years. And they, they left her body. She, they were gone. These cancerous tumors that she's going to die in three months were gone. And she was like, my son saved me, and these mushrooms saved her. And it was just, it's just incredible. Like, the power of mushrooms is unbelievable. I can't even, I did, I jumped into it. I couldn't believe what I found. So that's my project. That's mushrooms. I hope you guys try it. Go plant some mushrooms in your garden. It's super easy. It will do so much. And what I'm trying to do next is get more people to know about mushrooms because if you get it on a bigger scale, not just in your garden, they can actually fix the environmental problems. So thank you. I'm so honored to be here again and share with you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Daniel, you have no idea how excited we all are about mushrooms now. This is, <laughs> this is amazing, amazing stuff. Loved how you brought the passion about something that many people overlook, something like mushrooms and fungi, and we're able to expand out, show how something that can be so small can change the world. So yeah. great job, great job, um, really great presentation and, and great topic there. Um, next up, I have uh, Aria. Are you ready? There you are. Yep, I'm ready and I can share my screen now. Can everyone see my screen? It looks great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Adrija and I'm a rising junior from the Garden State of New Jersey. And this is actually my first year on the NYLC 
So I'm really grateful and excited to be here today. So today I'm gonna to be telling you about three books that I read way back when in elementary school and how these books have shaped the person I am today. So drum roll, because the books are A Pop of Atlas of the World, Magic Treehouse, and Magic School Bus. Okay, so let me just start off with this Pop of Atlas of the World, which my mom actually gave me when I was in second grade. So this book, it just instantly got me interested in geography because um, the extravagant landscapes, the diverse cultures, and everything else I saw in this book just got me so fascinated. And I wanted to expand this knowledge, so I chose to compete in geography competitions. And in addition to some gratifying state and national finishes at competitions, I realized that the knowledge I gained translated into a deeper understanding of issues in the world. So whether it be like floods in Bangladesh or wildfires in California, or even insurgencies in the Congo, I realized that this knowledge of geography helped me step into the shoes of impacted citizens and see problems in a different perspective. And seeing problems, I obviously wanted to come up with solutions. And this actually led me to my first major community service project. So basically my family and I, we went to Alaska when I was in eighth grade, and I realized how Alaska's geographic location, terrain, climate, how all of that contributed to the fact that the state was ranked 49th in terms of education. And coming from a state that ranks at the top tier of those rankings, I wanted to do something because I realized that there were students who were not getting the same opportunities as me. So um, what I chose to do is I hosted a home dining fundraiser and was able to raise over $500 and donated that money to Alaska Geographic so that they could use it to support Alaskan schools. And this was actually the first major project that I spearheaded completely on my own. So I was really proud of myself for exploring, observing, understanding, and taking action. And that's actually a perfect segue into my next book, book series rather, Magic Treehouse, because exploring, understanding, and taking action has been something that Jack and Annie, my childhood superheroes, and the protagonists of Magic Treehouse have been doing all along. So basically, they just climb up to their treehouse, open a book, wish that they could visit a place in that book, and then the treehouse just takes them there. And then they explore the place, meet new people, and help out the people in times of crisis. So what this book taught me was the importance of resilience, taking risks, and most importantly, helping those in need. And it also introduced me to many of the real life change makers I'm inspired by today, including none other than Dr. Jane Goodall. So I was first introduced to her work in um, Good Morning Gorillas, which is a Magic Treehouse book. And um, I've just been inspired by her, by her amazing work and perseverance spirit ever since. So that being said, belated is an understatement to describe how happy I was the day I got into the Roots and Shoots NYLC and received the opportunity to be a part of such an amazing group of amazing people, just be part of an organization that was founded by someone I've been looking up to for so long. And it's been an incredible experience so far, and I just hope to keep exploring and learning and making a difference with Jack and Annie. And with that, I come to my last book, Again, a book series, Magic School Bus, and how it led me to my favorite Roots and Shoots project so far. So basically, I just really loved how Mrs. Frizzle would take her students on the Magic School Bus to go on really cool field trips and learn about science. And that's what initially got me interested in science. And um, that love for science was basically cultivated in the classroom where I made baking soda volcanoes for my own plants and just did other cool science experiments. So fast forward to now, I realized that there were students who were forced to substitute these cool experiments with YouTube videos and online labs because of virtual schooling during the pandemic. And as someone whose love for science was cultivated in the classroom, I wanted to take action. So I realized that even though they can't be in the classroom, hands-on science can definitely be brought to them. So I spent some time creating a design plan for my first batch of experiment kits and before I knew it, I had a lot of leaf chromatography kits ready. And what you see over here are the final contents of my first batch of leaf chromatography kits. And once these were fully assembled, I just made my first delivery at the place where I discovered my passion for science, my elementary school. The students just had a week long window to pick up the kits. And then I scheduled a day for a Zoom call where I walked them through the experiment, 
And from the bottom of my heart, that day was truly, truly rewarding because I was able to share my love for science with students and to see them so excited to learn more. And since then, I've delivered kits to my local library, designed other types of kits like selling a bag and catapult kits. And I've also received a Roots and Shoots mini grant for which I'm really grateful. So I'm proud of myself for being able to reach some of the goals I set for myself, but I still have a long way to go. So I just hope to keep expanding my project just like this and following my passions to make a difference in my community. And that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adria. That was fantastic. I loved listening to you and um, hearing about the ripple effects too of your work and, and getting and working with other students and sharing your passion and your love. Well done. So good. So thank you for that and looking forward to hearing more for many years to come from you. So thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, my fellow palindrome, Hannah. Um, whose name is the same forwards and backwards like my own. So Hannah, take it away. Uh, so can everyone see my screen? Yep, it looks great. Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. And I'm so excited to uh, present uh, on my work this so far this year. Um, uh, so, so a little bit about junior in high school. Uh, I live in Tucson, Arizona, and I've been a member of Roots and Shoots for two years. Um, I'm really passionate about the environment and making a difference in my community. So when my sister introduced to me um, the National Youth Leadership Council, um, I was really happy to learn about it. Um, I'm the leader of the Roots and Shoots Desert Harmony Club and co-founder of Notes of Hope Youth. I also love writing and coding, and I've played the violin for eight years, um, which is one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate with Notes of Hope Youth. Um, I also play in two orchestras. So with Roots and Shoots Desert Harmony, we've done several projects throughout the year. Uh, one was the composting project where we learned about the benefits of composting and did individual composting at our homes. Um, we also had a cards for community project where we made cards for senior homes and we watched documentaries and learned about global warming throughout the year as well. Uh, so for our cards for community project, we realized that uh, seniors uh, throughout the pandemic might not have the best mental health, so we wanted to write cards for them uh, with positive messages to lift up their spirits. Um, the project was a success. Uh, people on both ends had a great time making the cards. Um, okay. For education, we also watched My Octopus Teacher and Kiss the Ground. Uh, both of these documentaries have been talked about totally worth the hype. Um, they were really educational and um, all the members of our club really enjoyed it. Uh, so moving on to Notes of Hope Youth, uh, we're a music recital program uh, composed of student musicians and we play for senior homes across um, our local Tucson area. Um, I'm really passionate about music has made such a big impact in my life and I wanted to help make a big impact in other people's lives. Uh, since the start of our organization, we have grown in numbers and outreach. Uh, we have um, got more players. Um, since, uh, in the beginning, it was only me and my sister, and it has grown to 10 plus players. We've also played at more nursing homes and done more collaborations, uh, which we're really excited about. For our growth on YouTube, we have over 11,000 views and 70 videos. Um, we're really happy about our online growth and where it has taken us. Uh, when we started, we only had a few subscribers and knowing that um, people are subscribing and watching our videos um, and participating is uh, making us really happy. Uh, we've also performed over eight concerts and counting and played at four nursing homes uh, and counting as well. And we have growing collaborations we actually played a concert for Groundworks Tucson, a local nonprofit with other artists and raised uh, thousands of dollars for them. And yeah, 
So for our summer 2021 concerts, uh, we played at three nursing homes. Uh, we played at Desert Springs Gracious Retirement Living on June 28th, Brookdale Ore Valley on July 4th, and All Seasons Ore Valley on July 1st and August 3rd. Actually playing at another nursing home later today, um, Mountain View Retirement Village, and I'm really looking forward to that. So our first nursing home we played at to start off our summer series was Desert Springs Gracious Retirement Living. Uh, we had about five players come in and it was so great. Everyone there uh, played so well and it was such an important recital because it started off our, um, our summer series. Uh, so it, uh, it went really well. We got lots of positive feedback and it really gave us hope for our next recitals. Uh, we also played at Brookdale Ore Valley. We were invited to perform there on the 4th. Um, Brookdale Ore Valley is Emmer's care home. And we love the idea of playing here because music is a very powerful tool that can be used to heal. And research has actually shown that listening to music and uh, singing along can provide um, beneficial um, benefits for um, emotions and uh, yeah. Uh, we also played at All Seasons or Valley. Um, we had a turnout in our audience of about 50 to 60 people. So it, uh, they were some of our biggest concerts. Um, we had guitar and vocalist along with piano. And we had about nine players come in. It was so amazing. And we got lots of positive feedback. Uh, and we have all of the clips on our YouTube channel as well. So it was really great. Um, on our YouTube, uh, we do upload videos regularly and we have live streams of concerts and individual performances. Uh, since the start of our YouTube channel, we've grown to over 1000 subscribers and um, we couldn't be more happy about our online presence and knowing that we are making a difference um, through um, the media as well as in person. So our YouTube channel name is Notes of Hope Youth if you wanna check it out. Um, one of the other projects I worked on this summer was uh, coding a website for Notes of Hope Youth. Um, I wanted to use my coding experience to grow our online presence even more, uh, seeing how our YouTube uh, grew a lot. So I used HTML and CSS as well as JavaScript uh, to code for this. And as you can see, it has this tab, uh, team and music. And yeah, so our website URL is down below if you wanna check that out as well. Uh, so finally, being a part of the NYLC has taught me so many things, um, has taught me how to lead and given me so many opportunities to do so. And I've really grown as a person through that experience. Uh, and I'm really thankful for that. It's also allowed me to meet so many amazing people, so many um, compassionate and determined individuals. Encourage me to do my best and sharing their stories has um, uh, uh, let me know that I am not alone in anything I do. Um, it also gave me the tools I needed to achieve my goals, and I couldn't be more thankful for that. All the support I've gotten is just amazing. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And a great job. Um, and loved hearing about how you're sharing your gifts of music with others and, and recognizing that kind of human connection that we can make through art and through music and really beautiful then leading and inspiring others to join you in that. So great, great work. Wonderful presentation. Um, next up, we have Chloe. Chloe, go ahead and take it away. Can everyone see that? So hello everyone, and thank you for coming to listen to our presentations. First off, a little bit about me. My name is Chloe and I'm a rising college freshman from New York. This is my second year on the council and in my free time, I love singing, drawing, and just learning more about how to live sustainably. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about one of my most recent projects, and it's a project that I'm really excited about. It's establishing a native plant garden near my school. 
And our goals for this project was really to first help pollinators by planting plants that are beneficial for them. We also wanted to help people by restoring this public space and also strengthening the connection between people and the environment by really educating our community members about what their role is in supporting and protecting local biodiversity. So this is what the site looked like before we started our project. And as you can see, it hasn't really been managed. There was a lot of branches and invasive shrubs and vines and all sorts of plants that were really choking out the native plants and taking all the resources. So the first thing that we had to do was remove all those invasive plants. And this was kind of hard because these plants had been growing for many years. As you can see in the picture in the top left, that was just one section of the root system of one of the plants that we had to take out. So there were a lot of plants like that. Uh, but eventually after several months, we were able to clear out enough area to start planting plants. So we laid down a bunch of cardboard and we planted some native plants and we really came to this garden to water it and take care of these plants so that they would grow into uh, plants that can sustain themselves. And by the end of it, we had created a garden. And compared to those pictures that I showed you earlier, this garden looked a lot better. But even more importantly, even just a few weeks or days even after we planted those first native flowers, we saw a tangible environmental impact. Students who were working at the garden reported seeing pollinators returning, like honeybees and bumblebees and flower beetles and hoverflies and so many others. In the top right, that's actually a picture that one of our Roots and Shoots members took of a hoverfly on a yarrow flower. So that was really exciting to see. But we also had a tangible community impact as well. Something that really surprised me when we were doing this project was just how many students got involved. We had in a very small school, over 50 students working on this project. And most of these students weren't in Roots and Shoots. Most of these students probably maybe hadn't even heard of Roots and Shoots, but they were willing to join us. They were willing to learn how to use the tools and identify the plants and just do work with their hands to help us create this garden. And that was so inspiring to me because of how many people from different walks of life were able to join us. We also wanted to use this garden as a way to really educate everyone about local biodiversity. Because it was on a public park, anyone could come by, anyone could enjoy the space. Um, and we wanted to put up signs and things like that to tell people why we planted these plants and what these plants were doing to help our ecosystems. And that was a really important impact of our garden. So what I learned from this project is that Reason Choose projects really can bring so many people together. It wasn't just students, but we reached out to teachers and administrators and uh, park staff and local plant experts. And so many people came together to help us with this project. Um, and it was so heartening to me to see how we were all working together to create something that didn't exist before. The reason why this project is also really impactful for me is because creating a native plant garden has always been something that I wanted to do. It was like a dream of mine. But if you had asked me from two years ago if I could see myself doing that, I would have said no, because I've always wanted to do something like this, but there were always these hurdles like, in order to make a garden, you have to have space and you have to have uh, people who are maintaining the garden and you have to have permission. And there are all these sorts of complications that make it hard to make a garden. But when we were starting out with this project, uh, we faced all these hurdles and we just kept going and somehow it managed to work out. So I think my advice for any Roots and Shoots members who are watching this presentation, who maybe have a dream or have a project idea that you think might not work out or that might be really, really difficult. My advice would be to just go for it, because once you start trying and um, once you start going at it, you might find that there are a lot more people than you expected who are willing to help you and are willing to join you. And that's what happened to me. So with that, I thank you for listening to my presentation.
That's great advice, Chloe, about um, going after something, having a dream, and then the amazing response that you can have where people come and join you on that journey. That is such wisdom and wise words. And I'm so glad that you had that experience with, with your garden. And really nothing can bring people together in, in that way as a community garden. And um, great project, great work. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Next up, we have Kate. Kate, take it away. The mic's yours. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Misher, as most of you know, and this is my presentation. Um, so first of all, to start, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm just so beyond grateful to be part of such a group of like-minded individuals who are just as inspired to make change. Um, I always leave our calls just so motivated and um, just full of hope, um, which I know everyone has said, but it's just so true. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, so to kind of give you some backstory on how I joined Roots and Shoots, I got involved in sixth grade and just fell in love with it. I loved Jane's message and just the whole concept of Roots and Shoots, being able to combine all my passions of people, animals, and the environment in one place. Um, my Roots and Shoots teacher is actually one of my biggest mentors to this day um, and kind of has inspired me to start my own Roots and Shoots club at my high school. Um, we've done amazing projects throughout COVID, like toy drives and thank you campaigns um, and homeless care packages. Um, and it's just really been amazing to continue on Roots and Shoots in high school. Um, so next kind of thing I wanna talk about is Team Enough, um, which is a youth coalition focused on making change in the gun violence prevention community. So kind of how I got involved was kind of through a personal experience. Um, my grandfather was actually shot and killed when my dad was only 12 years old. Um, so I've kind of seen how gun violence affects families and communities um, and just kind of always wanted to get involved and do my part, um, which led me to Team Enough. And I started my own LA chapter um, where our first project was a micro stamping bill um, micro stamping, for those who don't know what it is, is basically like tracing the bullet back to the gun, um, which can lead back to the owner of the gun. So in like a drive by shooting or something like that, where you might not know who was the one to shoot the gun, you're able to find that person, um, which can bring justice to so many families who deserve it. Um, so we lobbied state senators, met with their staff, and we eventually were able to get the bill passed through the state assembly and is now being enacted as the law, which is so amazing to see the work you do um, become part of the change. And now I'm working on a police accountability amendment to the law as police um, guns were left out of the bill originally. So my most current work with Team and Us have been related to ghost guns. So you might be asking yourself, what is a ghost gun? Well, ghost guns are basically like the Legos of guns. They're 80% assembled when you get them. Um, and with a few easy steps and tools you have laying around the house, you have a fully functioning gun. So why is this so dangerous? Well, they are designed to avoid all gun laws. They are pretty much untraceable and you can get them without any safety regulations because they're seen as not really guns. Um, so to kind of, we really wanted to show the world how these guns were affecting communities and how easy they were to get. So we created a video highlighting my team member, Stefan, who's seen in the top photo, experience buying a ghost gun. Now, Stefan is a 17 year old, 17, and he was able to buy a gun with no ID, no safety measures. So that kind of allows you to see the grad, the grad, um, the amount um, ghost guns have affected communities. Um, so this is kind of my next big focus. I really want to look at the mental health aspect of gun violence prevention. Um, I feel like it was kind of a hole in the gun violence 
um, gun violence prevention community. Um, it wasn't really talked about. And then when COVID happened, I could see the mental health issues in my community just kind of at an all time high with like isolation and other issues. Um, and as mental health problems arise, so do suicides. Um, and so having access to a firearm and an untreatable, untreated med um, mental health issue can lead to a plethora of issues and can make them all so much more deadly. Um, so that's kind of something I really wanna take a focus on. Um, lastly, I really wanted to talk about the homeless crisis in Los Angeles. Um, I know some people on the call here um, live in LA and can see the problem firsthand. Um, it's laid out all in front of us on the streets, everywhere. And so I really took an interest in finding why was this such a problem, why now? what was happening. And so I kind of took a step back and looked at all the problems and just to name a few like mental health, um, high rent rates, addiction, you name it, it's an issue. Um, so I took a step back and looked at the core needs for what this homeless community was really needing and decided to kind of start working with this organization called Lava May. Um, what Lava May does is they take buses and kind of repurpose them to put showers inside and they go around to homeless communities and provide clean showers. Most homeless people don't have access to clean showers. So when they try to go for that job interview, they try to go meet their family, whatever it might be, they can't look presentable enough to get it. Um, so I just thought that was such an amazing organization and I was just so lucky to be involved with that. And so kind of the last thing is I was looking back at my mental health work and gun control and I was just like, what? Can I expand this idea further? Um, so now I'm really looking at the homelessness and, men and mental health issue combined because so much of the homelessness in LA either had mental health, health issues to start and that's what caused them to end up on the street or once they were on the street, they had mental health issues. Um, so now I kind of really am looking at a way to tackle that issue head on. But yeah, thank you. That is my presentation. Great job, Kate. Um, the topics that you're hitting on here are such important topics, and it's inspiring to know that we have Roots and Shoots members who are delving into this, looking at ways to affect positive change and um, really activating as citizens um, towards that positive change. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Great, great job, Kate. Um, next up, we have Virginia. Virginia, there you are. Hello. Hello. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Virginia, and this is my third year as an NYLC member. So here's a little bit about me. I'm a homeschooled rising senior and I'm currently dual enrolled at my local community college. I recently moved with my family from North Carolina to Oregon and some of my goals for the future in relationship to my projects are to eliminate plastic pollution, combat climate change and work towards a solution to fix our recycling system. Some of my other passions include rock climbing, modeling, acting and just helping the earth. The first project I'm going to talk about is one I started in 2020 called Elvis Art. I hand draw nature inspired designs onto cards made from recycled materials. All my funds are donated to JGI and almost $400 has been raised and donated. I was also fortunate enough to receive a $200 mini grant from Roots and Shoots, which has covered the cost of cards and envelope purchases, as well as shipping and packaging costs. The picture on the right shows some examples of my cards. I sell them in packs of five and 10 at $10 and $18 respectively. I paused the project during the 2020 school year, but I've resumed it again. In March of 2020, I hosted a local stream cleanup. The stream is located in the neighborhood adjacent to my old house in North Carolina and is a convenient short walk away. Though unfortunately, due to COVID-19, the cleanup group was limited to only my close family, we were still able to collect approximately five large trash bags and pieces of an old car. 
I organized a cleanup with the help of the Hall River Assembly, a local watershed group. In the picture, you can see myself, my mom, my aunt, and my little sister holding some of the trash bags. And in the back of the truck, you can see a few pieces of the old car we found. The last project I'm going to talk about is my July single use plastic challenge. I started the challenge in July of 2019 and it was so successful that I decided to make it an annual event. The challenge is done through Instagram and three to four times during the month of July, I post about my challenge and share information on plastic pollution statistics. Day to day, I share tips on single use plastic alternatives as well as other anti-plastic posts. The challenge is a month long and it focuses on educating the participants on alternatives and ways to cut out plastic from daily life, as well as bring awareness to our plastic consumption, both personally and globally. I've received great feedback on the project and I plan on continuing it in the future. Besides the projects I've created, I've also participated in presentations for Roots and Shoots and JGI. In July 2020, I made a video answering questions about wellness and fitness for Roots and Shoots. In October 2020, I presented about my work and the work of Roots and Shoots to a class in New York. In March 2021, I created a video about my single-use plastic challenge for Roots and Shoots' 30th anniversary challenge. Finally, in August 2021, I hosted a takeover where I talked about my single-use plastic challenge for a company called Skip. I enjoy sharing about my work and the work of Roots and Shoots with others, and I hope to continue to have opportunities to do so. That's all. I want to thank JGI and Roots and Shoots for giving myself and the rest of the NYLC the opportunity to create projects and be a part of this amazing group of people. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, that was really wonderful. I love too how you touched on that even despite COVID, um, you were able to continue with your project and, and do the stream cleanup with your family, continue with the single use plastics. And thank you for being such a wonderful representative of Roots and Shoots um, and sharing your work on, on multiple different platforms. So great work and thank you for that. And thank you too for your art, my goodness. It's wonderful to hear um, that so many of the Roots and Shootsers here are helping support JGI through sharing your time and talent. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Rhea. There you are. All right, take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Rhea, and I will share my screen. Can you guys see it? Awesome. Um, cool. So my name is Rhea, and this is my second year on the National Youth Leadership Council. I am so lucky to be a part of this group, and I'm always so awed by the talent in this group and inspired by all the amazing projects. Uh, so about me, I'm a rising senior from New Jersey. I love to dance, read, and listen to music, and I love animals, and I'm really passionate about the environment. Going off of that, my Roots and Shoots group is Green Teens 101. This is a group of young conservationists, and our goal is to bring awareness to the issue of climate change. And we started with projects in our local community. Last year, before the pandemic, we stood outside of grocery stores and handed out free reusable cloth bags. And we hope to encourage people to use those reusable bags rather than single use bags. This allowed us to interact with the community and bring awareness to the detrimental effects of these single use plastics on our environment. This year during the pandemic, we focused on various other virtual events and activities. We all know that this year has been quite a challenge to connect with people. So to engage with younger students, we hosted a mini workshop and brought two high school speakers. One of our speakers spoke about sustainability and how other cities have implemented green technology to improve their environmental impact. Our second speaker spoke of her research on fertilization and growing trees. The purpose of this workshop was to get middle school students to start thinking about green technology and protecting the environment. We all know how difficult virtual learning has been, and it's been a little more rough for our younger peers. So last year, my friend and I started Homework Brigade. 
Our focus is to support virtual learning for students in our community by bridging the gap created due to the pandemic and connecting them with a mentor. Basically, we paired each student with a high school tutor who will help the student in any subject they choose. Because almost all of this year was hybrid or fully virtual, we had a lot of interest in this program and we we're super glad we were able to help so many students. I think we were also successful in giving parents a break from teaching at home and children were able to interact one on one with a cool older mentor. Since we started Homework Brigade in March 2020, we have recorded more than 1000 hours of tutoring. So in a year when online events become a norm, my school also jumped onto the bandwagon. We hosted our annual workshop online to introduce middle school girls to computer science. Cypher is a full day workshop where we teach CSS and HTML, and then we put everyone in small groups to create a website of their own. I believe it's important to level the gender disparity in STEM fields. And through this workshop, we're able to give young girls a role model in STEM and expose them to a new field that they may be interested in. Another virtual event I helped organize is the One Health Hackathon. One Health believes that optimal health conditions can be achieved by recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. Participants are basically required to use this One Health principle to find solutions for infectious diseases. These solutions can range from a website for information to an app that tracks the infection to a vaccination plan. And we had scientists and researchers as guest speakers and mentors for our groups. And we hosted many workshops to help them with their solutions. We had about 300 people sign up from over 39 different countries and had some really cool ideas presented. Uh, this summer, I uh, got the opportunity to participate in this amazing virtual program at Rutgers University. And I had got to do a research project and my project was about lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries are used in a lot of everyday items such as phones, laptops, and even electric cars. And because they're rechargeable, they can help us move away from standard fossil fuels, but they're also quite dangerous and can sometimes combust if they overheat. My research paper focused on studying what scenarios make lithium ion batteries reach their danger temperature of 69 degrees Celsius. And the goal is to make lithium ion batteries safe so they can replace other sources of energy. So that is basically how my last year has been. I did a bunch of different projects and it's amazing that during a pandemic with almost all activities held virtually, we could still get so much accomplished and I'm odd for how technology has enabled us to not only survive, but entertain, connect and with others all virtually, including this summit. Thank you. Maria, you hit the nail on the head with your, your final comment there. And that's, I was actually thinking about that during your presentation of the way that you really were able to pivot and use the environment in which we all found ourselves to connect with people. I love the idea of the homework brigade and connecting young people um, with the cool older mentors and role models. And that's what so many of you in Roots and Shoots are. And um, so well done, congratulations, way to think creatively and really still have major positive impact in a very complicated world in which we find ourselves. So well done, really great. Um, next up, we have a video presentation um, from Jonathan and Jonathan's not joining us live, but um, we have a recording from him and then we're going to take a few minutes of, of a break. Um, so I'd love to queue up Jonathan's um, video and, and have his shared with us and then we'll be right back um, after a few minutes break. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Liu. I am currently a senior in high school and this is my 2021 NYLC project. Uh, it's called the Smart Mirror. Okay, so the entire purpose of the Smart Mirror was to see if I could improve my productivity because with the um, 
with the transition to distance learning, I found that my concentration span was decreasing and I was just overall finding it harder to focus to what my focus on what my teachers were saying. So I thought of uh, the smart mirror and this is essentially a mirror, but on it, there's like a bunch of uh, useful things for you to look at. So first off, there's a clock. There's also important holidays, um, a news feed, which is at the very bottom. There's also a weather forecast. And then the most important thing that I put was a to-do list. So this is basically, it removes the need for uh, looking at your phone if you do have an app like Todoist. Um, it's just, um, you can just look at your mirror and then uh, whenever you want. And then that'll just tell you what tasks you need to complete for the day. Uh, in the mirror, as you can see, and as mentioned before, there's a clock, a news feed, and a weather forecast, which you can turn off if you're not comfortable with your location sharing. Uh, there's also a compliment in the very uh, middle of the screen. So right now it says Hello Beauty. But when you input your tasks into the Android app, which is uh, for the to-do list, it will replace the compliment with the task you need to complete in a bullet point format. So let's say you had homework to complete, then instead of Hello Beauty, it would just, it would just show uh, homework uh, in a bullet point. So essentially, uh, for the actual product itself, it's a monitor screen behind one-way glass and with a mini computer called a Raspberry Pi, which powers the monitor and gives it all the, uh, you know, the, the interface that you see there. So how it works, it uses a Raspberry Pi and a camera to provide live video and emotion detection. So the camera is uh, mainly for the live video feed and also for facial recognition. So the facial recognition would just detect what emotions you have. And depending on your emotion, it'll like provide you with recommendations. So for example, let's say you were in a sad mood and your face shows that, then it would provide like some meditation or some, some like enlightening activities for you to complete if you really wanted to do that. If you don't, it's completely up to you. Uh, there's also an app. Uh, it's called the, uh, the Smart Mirror Companion app. And um, it uses Google Firebase, which is basically a platform for developing apps. And it also has cloud storage. So this mirror uses Google Firebase to connect the app and the to-do list. So through the app, the user can enter tasks. And then these show on the mirror's interface. So without the app, it would be really tedious and you have to have a keyboard uh, to enter in your tasks for the day. But with the app, it just makes it a lot easier because you can just enter from your phone. And then because having a keyboard next to your mirror is kind of awkward. Uh, yeah. And we also had to prove that the mirror actually improved productivity. So here we call it just research findings. We did two experiments over two months and the first one dealt with 53 individuals uh, over two months, like I said. And then one month, uh, none of them used the mirror. And in one month, all of them used it. And then we just tracked the number of tasks completed uh, while they weren't using versus with the mirror. Uh, and then our result was 87% found that they were more efficient in task completion. So they just completed their tasks. They were reminded of them. Uh, while using the mirror and yeah our second experiment only had one individual um, purpose here was tracking the number of tasks forgotten each day so it does sound kind of weird at first glance but tasks are written on paper in the morning so on a small piece of paper the person would just write their task put it in a folder where they wouldn't look at it for the rest of the day and then at night they compare it to they compare their tasks completed or the number of tasks they remembered after you know the day's over and then they look at the paper and then they write uh the number of tasks they forgot on the uh, google spreadsheet so overall they remember 61 percent more tasks while using the mirror so that's also a success so from these uh i think i can say that the mirror does improve productivity 
And after, and I've been, I've also been using it, obviously. I wouldn't let these people use it before me. Uh, I would say that it's, it's good, but it's too like clunky. So there's too many words and stuff on the monitor that I don't know, uh, maybe some people don't find necessary. Uh, in the future, it can become a marketable product since a patent is also in the works. Um, but there are a lot of improvements, especially in our feedback form that we send to our participants. Uh, many of them agreed with me that it was clunky. It was overall, it was hard to take up on, but it was um, easy to use from then on. But it was like hard to adapt to it. Um, and then as for the design of it, there's also a problem in that it's too bulky. Um, so what I'm saying is that like there's a monitor and then there's one way glass and then there's also a small like palm sized computer chip. Um, yeah, that just makes the mirror like it's way too thick. So in the future, we're looking into seeing if we can find uh, just like a thinner, mo thinner monitor screen or just something that would just reduce the overall size, but it won't take away from the overall effect of the mirror. And that was my presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it and thank you for listening. It all began on Jane Goodall's front porch in Tanzania, when a group of students told her that they felt powerless thinking about the problems around them. She encouraged them to their voices and ideas to address the issues they saw head on. It all began on Jane Goodall's front porch in Tanzania when a group of students told her that they felt powerless thinking about the problems around them. She encouraged them to use their voices and ideas to address the issues they saw head on. Roots and Shoots was born. Now, Roots and Shoots is a worldwide movement. of thousands of passionate young people making big impact.
It all began on Jane Goodall's front porch in Tanzania, when a group of students told her that they felt powerless thinking about the problems around them. She encouraged them to use their voices and ideas to address the issues they saw head on. Roots and Shoots was born. Now, Roots and Shoots is a worldwide movement of thousands of passionate young people making big impact and it's growing. Whether it's natural disasters, homelessness, pollution, or even climate change, Roots and Shoots youth are taking on challenges in creating real positive change across the globe. Youth aren't just our future, they are our present, and they're changing the world today. Welcome back everyone to the second half of our 2021 summit. Um, we had some amazing presentations in the first half here and looking forward to hearing more from our incredible Roots and Shoots members um, across the country. So first off to, to head us off here on our second half is Dana. Dana, thank you for being here and sharing your project and work with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Does it look good? It does. Looks great. Perfect. So my name is Dana. I'm from Kissimmee, Florida, and I'm the president of the Gateway High School Roots and Shoots chapter. And this is my first NYLC summit, and I'm so excited to be here. I'll be touching on the importance of open conversation and awareness. So here's just some of the table of contents. I'll be doing open my chapter struggles and, and then I'm gonna to be touching on two of our projects that we've been working on, the monthly mindfulness and then make your mark event. And then I'll be going into conclusions on why this is important. So for our struggles with the COVID-19 pandemic as we're all at home, like, um, how we can make our projects. So how we adapted was we moved our chapter fully virtual on the Microsoft Teams platform, hosting meetings every other Friday after school. With project limitations, we incorporated digital projects such as the monthly mindfulness project that I'll be touching on in the next slide and inviting speakers to our events. Moving our club virtual also helped us reach out more and make and um, become more creative with our project ideas. So the monthly mindfulness event, the mission of the monthly mindfulness project is to create a safe space for students to learn and receive advice on prioritizing their mental health amidst the stress of school and the pandemic. In this project, we invite therapists and other mental health professionals as guest speakers, and we aim to open conversations surrounding mental health and mindfulness, destigmatizing misconceptions often brought up in homes and in society. Um, what inspired this project was a lack of mental health awareness, especially in our community. Moving digitally for school and having mental health struggles myself, it was more noticeable the lack of representation or resources of mental health in education. The Gateway High School Roots and Shoots chapter eventually came to the idea of monthly mindfulness. Oftentimes, monthly mind, uh, mental health can be um, seen as shameful, and we hope this project is able to shed new light and create new ideas of what it means to be healthy all around. Uh, with a lack of conversation about mental health, there's a lot of misconceptions, and we hope this is a safe place that people are able to come together and make a sense of community and feel open sharing their struggles and help them grow. So here are some past monthly mindfulness events that we had. We did host them on Zoom to be safe from COVID-19. On the left, we invited Mrs. Shawnee Tran, a licensed therapist, and then on the right, we um, invited Dr. Baker Hargrove, a licensed psychotherapist. Here's a more closer look at the guest speakers. On the left is Shani Tran's um, flyer that we used to uh, advertise for our events. And then on the right is for Dr. Baker Hargrove. The next project I'll be talking on is the Make Your Mark Art Gallery event. So for the Make Your Mark Art Gallery event, the Gateway High School Roots and Shoes chapter worked with the Thacker Avenue Elementary School to create an art gallery where elementary students can make a piece addressing an environmental, animal, social, or mental health issue. The artist with the most money raised for their piece was able to pick a nonprofit organization to donate that money to. And our mission for the project was to promote awareness within younger youth and to inspire change. An inspiration of this project was the political climate 2020 
as more concerns aroused, there became more youth activism. And especially with the pandemic, many issues hit closer to home. And it's important for younger children to explore these issues and gain perspectives so future generations are able to improve. I know when I was younger, let's say in elementary school, I was not introduced to mental health issues or any issues similar um, very much. So as like as I grew up being um, with our generation being close to digital um, digital aspects that um, I was I was kind of shocked when I saw these issues in my world and I knew I wanted to make change. So with the news hitting all these important issues and with younger children seeing these issues, we need to be able to um, help them educate themselves on these issues. And so they're able to make their own, their own conclusions about the issues and help them improve them. So here are some of the Make Your Mark art pieces that um, the kids at Back Revenue Elementary School made. These are the winning prizes. On the left is a project that has to do with plastic pollution in the ocean and how it affects turtles. In the middle, explores the polar ice caps, and on the right, explores panda, red pandas. So here are some of the Roots and Shoots chapter volunteers at Back Revenue Elementary School. And we are wearing our Roots and Shoots shirts that we used to help um, fundraise for our projects. So why is opening conversations on these taboo topics and promoting awareness so important? So opening conversations on various taboo topics like mental health encourages a safe space where we can learn from each other. Open conversation can help people feel less lonely with their struggles and find a community. We're able to introduce new perspectives and break down misconception and stigma. Promoting awareness, promoting awareness, especially within younger youth, inspires change in education as more issues hit closer to home. Thank you all for your time. I'm so excited to be at this NYLC summit, and I hope you have the, a great rest of your summit. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, for that important project and raising awareness and um, an open-mindedness about a very important topic and really appreciate you taking that on and sharing that not only with us, but with your larger community at your school and, and elsewhere. So well done, congratulations on that work and look forward to hearing more about it. So great job, great job. Next up, we have Will, and I see you there, Will. So the mic is yours. Okay, let me present my screen really quickly. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Will Sharuis, and I'm a 15 year old student from Miami, Florida. And today I'm gonna start off with a little background on what motivated my work. I've grown up in Florida, so I'm used to the summer storms and even hurricanes. However, recently the storms and the flooding have been getting worse and my home, in school would sit on the edge of Biscayne Bay and have flooded due to hurricanes before. When that happened, I learned that they're both expected to be uninhabitable by the year 27, 2070 due to sea level rise from global warming. And it turns out my community is facing climate change already firsthand. So four years ago, when I began advocating to protect our planet from the carbon emissions causing our planet to warm and our seas to rise, I have had I have tremendous respect for Jane, Dr. Jane Goodall, and found out that she supports youth environmental action through the Roots and Shoots Group. And with the support of the Jane Goodall Institute, I founded the Roots and Shoots Group Forces of Nature. Once I saw the problems, my goal was straightforward: to halt climate change. I am putting up just a few pictures of Miami after our last major hurricane a couple of years back, and as you can see it's clear we've got to do something to address sea level rise. Here's a look at what we're facing. So to talk a bit about how I got started, I spent the last few years meeting with political and business leaders to advocate to stop global warming. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to speak to leaders on all sides of what is arguably humanity's greatest problem of all time. I've talked with the Secretary of the United Nations, Patricia Espinosa, who told me young people must start the conversation. And I met with Gina McCarthy before her appointment as the White House Climate Advisor, who encourages youth to take action. For those of you not familiar with the Roots and Shoots website, this is exactly what the Jane Goodall Institute calls youth to do, take action. 
So I started a series of projects posted on the Roots and Shoots website. And my group's projects are focused around taking action to halt climate change. Initially, many of my Roots and Shoots projects were focused around advocacy. Before the pandemic shut everything down, I traveled to the United Nations World Climate Conference in Madrid, where I spoke on the impacts of climate change, which I have already experienced in my hometown. I also organized a climate strike that ended at Miami City Hall. And I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to participate with 7 million other youth in worldwide climate strikes in New York and Madrid. The good news is that the youth voice has brought more people around to the science. The role of the youth in the fight against climate change has now shifted from advocacy to education and to working on hands-on solutions. My Roots and Shoots group sponsored the 2020 and 2021 Miami Climate Summits in March. We provided free education on climate change to more than 1,100 students across the United States. And we kept the conversation solution-based. When Hurricane Eta devastated our Latin American neighbors, Forces of Nature spearheaded a project to help families who lost everything due to deadly mudslides. You can see here our project collected medical and food supplies. One thing I've learned from the Roots and Shoots project is that even if the project involves only a few students, it can make a huge difference. What we found in Central America, more than any supplies we brought, is that we brought hope. That actually kind of surprised me in a good way. So that kind of sums up how I got started working on the issue of climate change and my involvement in Roots and Shoots. This all led me to my current work. Recently, an oceanfront condo building in my neighborhood collapsed. The causes remain unknown and are currently under investigation by experts. But as you can see, the proximity of the building to the ocean is very close and saltwater intrusion was discovered at the building's foundation. This collapse initiated my recent Roots and Shoots project that I'm going to share today. The problem is that global warming is intensifying storms and causing sea level to rise. And over the last 25 years, developers have removed 25% of all mangrove that protected our shores from washing away into the sea. The effect is that human development and pollutants have eliminated those protective mangroves, leaving a coastline that looks like this and now like this, rather than like this. The collapse was so devastating to our community that my family and friends, my, that even so, I was motivated to begin a new Roots and Shoots project to protect our coastline. Last week, I met with Florida Congressman Deutsch and Congresswoman Castor in Washington, D.C. to push for funds from the new federal infrastructure plan to protect our coastline. And I'm meeting with our mayor to bring the city my new roots and shoes project pictured here. To begin my project, I had to do a little research. I learned that mangrove roots are what anchor the sand to present beach erosion. But I also learned that mangroves are great at absorbing carbon emissions. And it turns out mangroves also provide shelter for coral reefs being lost to climate change. But one problem I came across in my project is that although mangroves are easy to destroy, they're hard to replace. And I learned that planting mangroves on their own where they didn't exist before won't work. The best opportunity is to clean up the roots of existing mangroves so that they can regenerate on their own. This part of the project is really reproducible for any of you who live near the coast. It's basically a cleanup that gets plastics out of the mangrove roots so that they can do what they're supposed to do. Mangroves actually hold the coastline in place. And if my project works, I will take it to our city and our state to request they, that they plant mangroves on a large scale. This is the climate clock in New York, revealing that we have seven years left to avoid the worst effects of climate change. But if we take action now, over the next seven years, we can do enough to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So I'm ending with some good news. I just found out yesterday that my Roots and Shoots group has been accepted to attend the upcoming United Nations World Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland this November, where I'll be speaking about the climate impacts in my community and some of the solutions initiated by my recent Roots and Shoots project. Thank you.
Well done, Will, and congratulations on all of your success in sharing your message and your learnings with a broader audience. It's really extraordinary and wonderful to see you um, in such a leadership position on these issues. So well done, well done. Um, I also appreciated how you took something that was a, a tragedy um, in your in your home and were able to turn that and learn from it and and learn about the mangroves and, and other issues. So well done. Great, great project. And thank you for sharing it with us. Next up, Victoria, I see you there. So take it away. Thank you. OK, actually present. Um, see. Can everyone see it? Kind of. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is my Roots and Shoots National Youth Leadership Council 2021 Summit by Victoria Solano. I am an incoming junior in high school, and this is my first year on the National Youth Leadership Council, and I'm so excited to show you my work. I want to start um, this presentation off with a quote from Jane Goodall. And I really love this quote and I really like to live by it. And it says, only if we understand, can we care? Only if we care, we can help. And only if we help, we shall be safe by Jane Goodall. Um, and here's just like a little introduction of myself. Um, I like to consider myself a globally conscious advocate of human rights. And I constantly strive to better the condition of the less fortunate. And I see Russian Suits and the National Youth Leadership Council as a big family and a group of people who believe in each other and work to better the world through leadership. When I think of Roots and Shoots, I think of a group of unwavering professionals who constantly create ideas for change to advise, inspire, and improve life through projects and determination. My current life in this pandemic has shown me the importance of knowledge in our lives. Knowledge is the foundation of positive change that can be used to help less fortunate people in times of crisis. And I believe that in combination with good leadership and current cutting edge technology, knowledge is a powerful tool that will help solve problems and unite different people from all around the world. Um, first of all, I'd like to show you my grandmother. And um, this is going to give segue to one of my Roots and Shoots um, group that I'm, creating, that I'm creating right now. It's called Books for Change. And this is important because Books for Change like donates books to cancer hospitals and research centers. And this is important to me because my grandma actually had cancer twice and survived both times. And I can't imagine what small children have to go through with the pressure and the pain that they have to go through is huge. And I believe it's important to try to take care of them. And I really want to find a way to help look out for them, like how my family looked out for my grandma. She's extremely important to me because she's a big source of inspiration for my work, because not only was she a two time cancer survivor, but she was also a teen mom who got cancer at a very young age. Um, whenever I, I'm having a slump in my work, I always look to her for a source of inspiration. Um, this is the books of the project Books for Change. I have come in contact with my school, um, Our Lady of Mercy Academy an all girls school who has agreed to host a week long book drive for a reading week when we return back to school in September. I also have a close friend who's a librarian and will be glad to donate books. Um, I have also began to get in contact with hospitals and doctors such as from Mount Sinai. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's very big in like New York, Long Island, um, who could help reach out to different cancer research centers and hospitals. I'm so excited because the donation hasn't even started yet and I'm already receiving books and I have a big box like in my basement and I'm so excited to just start donating them. And this is the science behind it. Um, here's just like a little quick fun fact. The oldest library in the world belongs to Pharaoh Ramses II and above the entrance reportedly it reads the phrase the house of healing for the soul. In more recent history, mental health practitioners use literature in the therapeutic context. Um, and this is known as bibliotherapy or the use of books and therapy. And it's a relatively common practice for many helping professionals today. An article published by the American Counseling Association describes several healing properties of reading and modern day therapy practices. And here I just listed a few benefits of bibliotherapy, which includes empathy, where readers may identify with the characters in the story, gaining a deeper understanding for the feelings and emotions of others through literature. Um, the second one is reduced negativity, 
Reading can diminish negative emotions, transforming them into more positive feelings and attitudes. This emotional transformation can yield a more reassuring outlook. The third one is self-awareness, which is through reading, people may learn more about their inner self, including their strengths and their weaknesses. And the last one has to do with hopefulness, um, which I relate to a lot. And um, basically it says that people can relate to the struggles and the triumphs of characters that they read about and they will help them develop a more greater sense of hope in the trials of real life. And this is how it helps with cancer. Professionals at the University of Texas MD Anderson Center um, claim that reading Cancer Center claim that reading books can help cancer patients and their caregivers. There are many great books to help in coping with cancer and may even relieve some of the pain. Dietary books may help patients gain a deeper understanding of healing properties of nutrition and foods they might eat to improve their health. Some authors compose cookbooks with cancer patients in mind. One might read about foods that boost the immune system and aid in healing after cancer treatments. People affected by cancer might also enjoy reading nonfiction personal accounts of cancer survivors. Readers can relate to the struggles of facing cancer and find hope in the triumphs of others. Reading memoirs of survivors can also help family members better understand their loved ones' fears and emotions surrounding their diagnosis. Um, this is just also a quick glance of what I do, um, just talking more about Books for Change. Um, Books for Change is a Roots and Choose project that I'm creating where we partner up with libraries and bookstores to donate books for, to children's cancer hospitals and research centers. And this is just like my hope for the future. In the future, I also hope to contact authors and interview them to create an inspirational, just like a bunch of inspirational videos for children. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited for that to see where that's going to lead. And this is another quick glance of what I do. I'm currently working on a project that will enable me to give back to my Mexican roots. I have done several studies for many years trying to understand and support poor and isolated regions in different parts of the world. And I'm taking over a project in Hidalgo, Mexico with the organization Corazón Verde. I have been working on this project to help the women in poverty support their families, strengthen their human rights, and enable them to live successful and prosperous lives. This project has profoundly moved me because of all the stories my mother would tell me of all the oppression these women have to face. Our goal is to help the women in need who face this inequity due to their lack of money, native origins, and the discrimination they go through for being a woman. This is an important opportunity to give back while exploring my Mexican heritage. In this summer, I actually just returned this Sunday from Mexico where I spent three weeks there talking to the women and also getting a better understanding of their life and how to spread their story. And this is um, just an uh, excellent, all right. Uh, and this is why that relates to it because this is my goal for this. My goal for this is I have actually told these wonderful women about Roots and Shoots and they have fallen in love with Roots and Shoots and Jane Goodall's work. I'm hoping to create a group which will raise awareness to these women and their story. They have donated some of their beautiful artisan work, which I actually have here. Like they're just like little just bags and just cute little stuff here for Corazón Verde. And it's all just handmade by them. And um, they have donated that and their beautiful artisan work, which I have here. And I'm planning to go to libraries and like farmers markets to spread these women's stories and sell their products which the women would actually like to be donated to Roots and Shoots. Um, and here's another quick glance of what I do. And this is on the Long Island Sound. Another project I'm working on has to do with water and the oceans. And this project will host beach cleanups and presentations to give awareness to sea life every week. This greatly impacted me because throughout my whole life, I've always lived near the water. I was born in Miami, Florida, and I currently reside on Long Island, New York. And this project has also greatly impacted me because during the Bay excursions, we get to see firsthand the damage of pollution and garbage have both on the sea creatures and their habitat. And our goal is to help clean the oceans, but also do lab research, which I'm currently doing with my friend. And um, that cute little guy over there, the little bird, that's actually called a piping clover. And it's one of the many endangered species here in Long Island beaches. And our goal is to help protect them and to and for us just more like mentality that the beaches aren't just not there forever. It's our responsibility to help clean them and ensure that all the animals there are living safely. Thank you. That's everything. <laughs> I'm so sorry.
Great job, Victoria. Um, really nice projects and wide ranging, which is great. It's wonderful to see the international reach of your work too. That's a really beautiful component that you're bringing into it and exploring all these subjects. So really great. The healing power of books um, is, is such an important topic as well. So congratulations and great work. Um, next up, we have Chloe. I see you there, Chloe. So the stage is yours. Um, hi, I'm just going to um, share it really quick. Can you guys see it? Okay, so hi, my name is Chloe. Um, I'm 15 years old. Uh, this is my dog, Hercules. I obviously love him a lot. He's like a big part of my life. Um, I like to bake, I crochet, um, I like music, I like going for bike rides, um, and I'm interested in biomedical in the biomedical field. Um, so I've been involved with recent shoots for about five years. However, this is my first year on the council. Um, I had uh, two school-based groups that I founded and I've done a lot of stuff there um, through five years, of course. I've done like meatless and vegan potlucks um, just to help like raise awareness of overconsumption, its effect on animals and the world and human health. Um, I've participated in plantings with the local Native American nation, the Tohono O'odham. I've learned about their culture as well as their day-to-day -day lives. Um, there, I've volunteered at therapeutic animal ranches right there, um, no-kill animal shelters, recycling plants, and so much more. Um, I recently spent three weeks volunteering at Gap. There's me. I covered my face with the heart because I was. It was like seven in the morning. <laughs> okay. Um, anyways. So yeah, I volunteered there for three weeks and it was really awesome because um, like I previously mentioned, I like baking a lot and culinary arts and I was able to work with Gap Ministries um, and they work with foster families. So I was able to give meals to the kids and make them and I got to work with an iron chef and that was really amazing for me. Um, so I could really just combine my interests. Um, so I just wanna say that all of this was possible with the amazing help and support of my parents. Um, I was really young when I first learned about Jane Goodall, similar to Caleb. Um, I learned it through um, an English project where I had to read a biography about her. And I saw the stuff she did and I listened to um, like uh, like um, videos and movies and everything, like all documentaries I could find. And I was super invested. Um, anyways, so this is all possible because of my parents. Um, I wanted to volunteer and arrange meetings and I was really avid about learning about all this stuff, but I was like 12. So it was really hard for me to like contact a grocery store and try to talk about reusable bags when I'm 12, like the manager of a chain grocery store, they would not trust me. So um, it's really hard to do that and it can be discouraging. And I just wanna say that you have to let the determination outweigh the obstacles in your life. Um, that's really how you get through all this stuff. Um, and I'm so thankful to have such amazing like teammates and admin in the um, council because I know this year has been so hard for so many people and every meeting we have together just inspires me so much, whether it's just like a checkup or a professional webinar. This year has been really challenging for everyone, but being able to see the change others can enact can really just make you feel like you can do anything. Um, that being said, I know that in the past there have been so many different topics that need to be discussed, like climate change, there's been systemic racism, animal abuse and neglect, gun control, um, the rise in domestic abuse recently, mental health, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of things, but I chose to focus um, on the chi uh, child labor since we were all in home this year. Uh, we all had to buy clothing and a lot of the fast fashion websites do use that a lot. Um, and not only fast fashion, actually a lot of um, things in like malls, everything from luxury brand like Gucci to like uh, mall stores and common things like Walmart and Forever 21, they outsource um, their clothing and they make it be made in sweatshops, primarily in Africa and Asia. Um, so basically um, Abercrombie and Fitch has um, Victoria's Secret, Zara, Gap, Converse, Nike, Adidas, H&M, Hollister, all these well known brands, they've all had child labor accusations against them, which have been proven. Um, and the way a lot of these brands tend to avoid the consequences of child labor in the US since it's illegal is using outsourced sweatshops. If you don't know what a sweatshop is, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it is a factory or workshop, especially in the clothing industry, where manual workers are employed at very low wages for long hours and under poor conditions. These workers can be anywhere from children to pregnant women. Um, 
Abercrombie and Fitch has been using child labor for a while and um, they have had nationwide protests. They have been exposed multiple times for operating sweatshops with child employees. And it does not only affect the current population, but also um, the future generations because um, it's, it's a cycle, you know what I mean? Um, basically, when you employ a kid when they're young, they rarely complete their full education, which means they're stunted in that area. When they grow up to become adults, there's a lack of specialization of labor since they weren't able to achieve that full education. That means that then once they're adults and they create a family, they will have once again low paying jobs, which means they will have to employ their children to have jobs as well. So it's really just a cycle. Um, and you have to learn how to break that. And I will present some solutions later because I know that spreading awareness is great, but at the same time, it doesn't really help fix a topic unless you have a solution. Um, so yeah, now I brought some statistics with me. So this true cost thing shows um, the effects of child labor from everything from health to education, opportunity, and the children. Um, and families, the economies and impacts as well, and the clothing image shows the common manufacturer's prices and the geographic locations where the items were made. Like I previously mentioned, Gap, American Eagle, Outfitters, Old Navy, all of these really common stores you see in almost every mall. Um, sorry, I wouldn't let me skip. So I have this other map that is the latest index map, and it shows um, the risk globally. And as you can see, Africa and Asia are the places with the most, as well as South America. Um, and these are the solutions. So if you want to buy new clothing, um, there, are mo there are apps you can use, um, like uh, Good On You, Save Your Wardrobe, etc. They focus on finding ethically sourced clothing. Um, and upcycled clothing, if you want to buy like um, reused ones, there's Grailed, the Real Real focuses on designer companies if you're into that, and there's also Depop, and if you want to not use an app and go in person, we all know Goodwill. Um, and it also employs um, disadvantaged people, so you'll be supporting them too. Now, um, also, if you want, um, I'm sorry, my notes are like weird. Okay, so you want to speak confidently about a topic right so you have to become educated on the companies that you love in order to speak with confidence and knowledge and um, spreading your knowledge to others is what i'm doing right now and it really helps obviously so yeah and just so you know everything you do matters no matter how small you think it is so just make sure that no matter what you're always trying to make an impact and uh yeah to close it up I cited my sources and I put a Jane Goodall quote that I really like and I relate with, um, that every individual matters, every individual has a role to play and every individual makes a difference. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chloe, my goodness. Um, those quotes were perfect and spot on, especially that last one, talking about individuals and, and some of the issues that you were talking about related to the clothing industry and others are really understanding where things that we we buy and we wear where they come from so well done taking on a very important big subject and in sharing what you find with others so congratulations Thank great you so stuff much. keep it up keep it up so well done chloe um next up i have margaret and i see you there margaret so the floor is yours looking forward to hearing about your work Thank you so much, Anna. All right, I gotta share my screen real quick. Can everyone see that? Hopefully. It looks great. Okay, so my presentation is Return to the Roots. So I live in Osceola, Wisconsin, which is right next to the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. And my mom is actually the superintendent of the park. So we've spent a lot of time out on the river. And I like to describe myself as raised by a river. Um, I've learned most of my best qualities in life from the water, from watching, um, from collecting bugs, and lately from paddling. So on this picture, um, I've got my Barbie life jacket on. Do not have a paddle because I could not paddle a canoe at that age. And I just seen snake. And in this picture over here, 
Um, I had seen a snake earlier that day and my Barbie life jacket got an upgrade, but overall the water is where I'm happiest. So a lot of my projects have been focused on water pollution and the main thing that is really impacting um, specifically the river is plastic. So we've done, um, well, first I started our sustainability club at my school, um, which has been a really great experience, really um, a learning experience. And our first kind of project was just monthly garbage cleanups. So we go out every month, pick up a bunch of bags, um, bring them back, throw them in the garbage. And that was great, but I still didn't feel like I was doing enough. So um, one of the main issues at my school was that we were using styrofoam lunch trays and styrofoam is the worst type of plastic. Um, do not want that stuff. And the fact that we had reusable trays that we could use um, was really confusing to me. So I had to meet with our food service director and we really just talked through the issue and started brainstorming some ways. And by the end of the school year, we were able to stop using our styrofoam and transition over to our reusable trays again, which again was great, but I still felt like I needed to do more. So I did a presentation with our fifth graders at OAS um, and we had a bunch of different stations and we like talked about reducing, using, recycling um, and just a lot of different things with that. And then did other projects through sustainability club, but most of them are pretty small. So these are my three big projects of the year which were all great and I learned a lot and I'm thankful for them. But by the end of the year, I was completely burnt out. I didn't want to do environmental stuff anymore. Um, and mostly because it was just so depressing and I really couldn't, I couldn't find a reason that I was like, I'm telling everyone that they're making a difference, but I still don't feel like I'm making a difference. And I don't know if this is really working. So that was how I felt until about a month or two months ago when I went to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area in northern Minnesota. And I went through Camp Minogin, um, which is a YMCA camp. And basically what you do in the Boundary Waters is you paddle your canoe and then you get out of your canoe, you take your Duluth packs out of your canoe, you put the canoe on your head and you walk on a trail that has like five million rocks on it. And then you put your canoe down, put everything back in your canoe, go back for the packs, put those in your canoe, and then paddle and do it all over again. Um, and through the Boundary Waters, I learned a lot. Um, and here's basically just a little rundown. 25 lakes in 12 days with nine women, three canoes, and one bottle of Cholula hot sauce. These are some of my favorite pictures um, from the best sunsets and times on the lake. Um, main most important thing that I learned was that wolf spiders can swim. Didn't know that before. They hop and then they can swim and then they can climb in your canoe. And all of a sudden you're in the middle of a lake and you have a wolf spider in your canoe. So that was pretty um, terrifying. <laughs> um, and these are all quotes from my journal, by the way. Um, but the thing that I want to focus on is that as much as I need, I want civilization, this is where I feel at home. And the Boundary Waters for me has answered the question of why. Why am I doing this? Why am I um, still working hard to protect the environment? And why do I have hope? And in the Boundary Waters, um, first of all, it's one million acres of wilderness. Um, it's beautiful. There's minimal people and nature is thriving. Nature is all over the place um, and the wild just takes over and it does its own thing. Even if people are there, um, it can recover and it can keep going and growing. And then the second reason is that I know that I am not the only one who feels this way about the Boundary Waters. I know that I'm not the only one um, that has ever felt this way about nature. And for me, that means that if there's any chance that what I'm doing makes a difference, it's a chance that we can't afford to not take. Um, and that's really encouraged me through the past few months with COVID and everything to just keep going and keep focusing on projects and keep working together um, to protect the places that we love.
So thank you. One more picture of the Boundary Waters and the canoes. Um, and I hope that someday you guys can get out on your own adventure in nature, maybe even today, go outside after this um, and explore the place we call home. Thank you. Margaret, great projects. And um, I loved how your projects spanned both from being inspired in your local school um, and making changes there to then taking us through this, um, this journey of uh, discovery with the, the Boundary Lakes and the canoe trip. And thank you for teaching me something today. I had no idea that wolf spiders could swim. So I um, appreciate <laughs> knowing that now and I'll, I'll keep an eye out for them in the future out in the water. So thank you, Margaret. Great projects. Great work. Um, next up is Zachary. I see you there, Zachary, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much. Um, let me know if you can see this. Yep, looks awesome. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Zachary. I'm just so excited to be here today. I've learned so much already and your projects are just like super inspirational. I'm taking notes. I'll bring it back to my local Roots and Shoots group because I'm just amazed. So first off, I want to tell you guys a little bit about who I am. So I'm from the Los Angeles area of Southern California and I go to Calabasas High School. Um, I'm actually a senior now. In addition to Roots and Shoots, I've, I'm actually serving on the Environmental Commission for my city. This is an advisory board to the city council, and we make suggestions um, regarding policy and plan events like Arbor Day and Earth Day. Um, here's an, a good picture of my school's Roots and Shoots Club. I've been involved since my freshman year, and I've actually served as the president for the last two years. And this is actually my first year on the National Youth Leadership Council. So the project that I mainly am focused on today is um, regarding rodenticides. So rodenticides are rat poison, and they can be found in these little black boxes as pictured here. You can find them everywhere, shopping centers, schools and cities and alleyways. If you're looking for them, you will you'll find them everywhere. And the problem with rodenticides is that they often get passed up the food chain. So when like the intended target, which is usually like a, a rodent, when it eats the poison, it doesn't immediately die. Instead, it goes into the wilderness where it can be eaten by bobcats, mountain lions, raptors such as owls and hawks. Um, and the problem with that is that it passes the poison up the food chain. So it's going to kill those larger animals. And this is especially concerning in the Southern California region because our mountain lions are already extremely threatened and rodenticides just add on to the, the, the dangers to these mountain lions. And so there are thankfully some solutions to the rodenticide problem. Um, one such solution is prevention. This is a photo that I actually took at a local shopping center. You can see that the dumpster, the lid's just left op open, there's trash spilling out, and it's just it's providing easy access for rodents to, to eat food. And so um, I'm actually working on enforcing um, these centers to shut their dumpsters, which would um, prevent rodents from having food and would therefore you know, decrease the amount of rodenticides that need to be used. Um, and then of course you have your natural rodent repellents besides just poisons. Um, so peppermint is actually a great rodent repellent. Um, it can be a little invasive, but if you have planting a garden and you want to repel rodents, this is a great option. You can also use peppermint oil rather than planting peppermint. And then of course, owls and hawks, right? Because they eat rodents. And so they're going to decrease the amount, the, the rodent population. And so on this um, assumption, my school's group actually built owl boxes. Owl boxes are birdhouses for owls. Um, and you can see in these photos, we built them from scratch and we went to Home Depot, bought the plywood. Um, some of us learned how to use, use drills for the first time. So, you know, not only was it an awesome learning experience, but it just created you know, some, some tangible, impactful change. Um, and you see here, um, we built four owl boxes in total. Um, the color changed a little bit because we coated them to make them water resistant so that they wouldn't rot when, you know, the rain season came. Um, and on the right hand side there, you can actually see a photo of one of our owl boxes mounted in a tree. 
And the great thing about these owl boxes is that our school administration actually removed all rodenticides from campus because um, not only did we not want to poison our owls, but you know now we actually have some um, some rodent repellents on campus. So you know if any of you guys see these rodenticide boxes, um, I I really suggest you know building owl boxes. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and then I'll, I'll touch on a little bit some other projects that we worked on this year. Whoops. Okay, here is a um, a picture of um, a trash cleanup during the Connect the Change campaign. Um, we picked up a lot of plastic and excess leaves, and we all had a great time. Um, and then here is a whoops, sorry. Um, here's a photo of actually a sign that we installed on campus. Um, the coyote is our mascot. So we called that area where we had the trash cleanup. We named it the Coyote Trail. Um, it kind of prevented students from using a name that, you know, the administration didn't really like for the trail. And so we actually spoke at our school district's board and they agreed to help us um, create the sign. We designed it and they helped fund it. So. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been such an awesome morning for me, afternoon for a lot of others. Um, you know, feel free to follow uh, our Instagram at Calabasas Roots and Shoots. You know, to get some more details about past projects and you know to stay current on future ones. Thank you all so much. Zachary, great work. Um, I love how tangible of a solution you were able to give all of us too about the owls and and working with the schools and others. Um, to help prevent and, and find solutions. So well done, really enjoyed that, thank you. Um, next up is Everett. Let's see, there you are, Everett. Hello. Fantastic, can I confirm that we are looking at slides? Confirm. Awesome. All right. So hello, my name is Everett. I am from Michigan, and this is my fifth year on the NILC. So first off, a couple things about me. I absolutely love being outside, camping, hiking, backpacking, running, kayaking. It's my element. Um, I have been going to Lake Michigan any chance that I can this summer. I absolutely love my dogs, Clark and Lola, and my cats, uh, Darth Vader and Dr. Meow Meows. Clark is my outdoor pal. So if you've heard me present before, much of this is going to sound familiar, but stick with me for some updates at the end. Um, I have been a part of many different campaigns and projects over the years that are solving many different issues within um, my community and other communities. Uh, for five summers, I was a volunteer at the Leslie Science and Nature Center. I was a Youth Guidance Team founder and member, uh, where I was not only able to help kids explore the natural areas around them, but teach them how to protect them. I participated in monthly trash cleanups with the organization Keep Nature Wild, where I cleaned up 175 pounds of trash along beaches and roads. I also had the opportunity to lobby for equal access to education in Congress, as well as selected to join a 2019 leadership fellowship. So this brings me to my most uh, consistent project. In 2014, I raised money through my school to provide a bike to uh, a girl so she could access edu education. Um, education has always been something that's really important to me, and I wanted to find a way to help more young people around the world get access to the education that they fundamentally deserve. So the next year, I won a $500 scholarship that allowed me to kickstart this project. The essay that I wrote uh, helped me come up with the idea of selling uh, handmade wire bikes to raise money for an organization called World Bicycle Relief that uh, designs, it's a global nonprofit that designs, assembles, and distributes Buffalo bikes to people in developing countries to help them gain access to education, work, and healthcare. So this is when I started the Good Spokes project and I've been working on it since. Uh, throughout the next like three years, I attended different community events with my wire bikes, which were much updated from the original ones, uh, along with watercolor cards. Uh, over that time, I raised $2,550 for World Bicycle Relief, and I found that people are much more willing to purchase something 
where the funds go to a good cause than to just outright donate money directly. Last year, I got into block printing. There's something really relaxing about it. Um, after trying out some different designs, I made it into a good spokes project. I carved and printed six different images and finally started an Etsy shop. Um, over that time, I raised about $100 between five different community organizations. I also got really into digital drawing last year and designed a No Planet B drawing that got printed on stickers, shirts, and sweatshirts. Uh, throughout the two week campaign, I again raised about $100 for JGI and also got to see the art that I uh, had put so much time in to go from the screen of my iPad to a physical tangible item. For Pride last year, I made some stickers and had them shipped to me so that I could sell them. Um, these went to an organization called the Trevor Project that provides support and crisis resources to young queer people. And continuing the digital art theme at the end of May 2020, I did digital portraits of people's pets for a $15 donation to the My Local Humane Society. Um, over the course of the two weeks, I raised $1,920 received 88 portraits or 88 orders and 141 portraits, which I had never had that much of a response to my project all at one time. So I definitely learned a lot from it. Um, and then over the last year, I've had kind of a trickling stream of um, commissions, which has raised an additional 80 to like $120 for HSHB. At the beginning of this year, I made some hand-stitched uh, notebooks with um, little digital illustrations that I made. And Goods Books is something that I want to grow with me and something I always wanna be working on and evolving. Uh, most importantly, I wanna keep creating, exploring different and new types of art and using that passion to create positive change in my community. So some upcoming projects I'm working on this month, I'm hosting a uh, end of summer trash cleanup I have shirts that are available to purchase with our little cleanup logo um, with the fund supporting JGI and am encouraging folks to get out and pick up trash in the natural spaces around them. I have a Google form um, and then one randomly selected participant will receive a free shirt. Um, the form is just a quick way for people to reflect on um, how much trash they cleaned up, what they noticed about the trash in their area and what that experience was like. Uh, also, right now, I'm working on adding an educational component to the items that I make for the Good Spokes Etsy, um, which is why it's mostly empty right now. Uh, my goal is to identify significant species in Michigan to educate uh, folks on wildlife within my community. Um, this is a wood relief print of a blue heron, which is a pretty common aquatic and non-aquatic bird in Michigan. Um, it's one of my first wood prints, and it's uh, in progress, so that's why it looks a little bit rough. Um, and then one of the reasons that I didn't develop too much of my projects this year was because I started my college program. Um, this year, I'll be a senior at Michigan State University, uh, majoring in environmental studies and sustainability. Um, I could talk about this for hours, uh, hours on end about how much I love my program, um, but I don't have that time. So what I will say is that I really struggled to find a major and a career path that incorporated my work with Roots and Shoots and my passion for being outside and just projects that I have been doing for many years. Um, and since joining the program, I have really gained practical skills that have directly related back to projects that I've done and has helped me gain a deeper understanding of sustainability. Um, as long as everything works out this year, I will be an intern for one of my professors uh, working, assisting with a citizen science project that uses drones to monitor coastal processes along the Great Lakes. So this is what I have for today. Thank you for tuning in. Amazing, Everett. Again, I am flabbergasted by the kind of talent that is represented among this group from dance to block prints and um, everything that this, this group is doing. It is absolutely incredible. And um, the way that you are expressing your interest through Roots and Shoots, it's just phenomenal to see. So great work and looking forward to hearing of many more years of great work from you. So thank you, Everett.
Um, moving on then, we have up next uh, Mahir. Let's Hello. see where, there you are, okay. Uh, okay, let me show my screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay, perfect. So hello, everybody. My name is Mihir. Um, this is my second year on the council and second year working with Roots and Shoots at all. So prior to the council, actually, I had no experience with Roots and Shoots, but since then I've learned like a ton. And I founded the Roots and Shoots chapter in our county, um, which is at Gateway High School, and now have left it to Dana, who is now the new president and an NYLC member that you heard, um, who actually gave a presentation earlier. So last year I ended up giving a presentation on failure because a lot of our projects were not working out and self-reflection. Um, and so this year we've had a lot of success. And so after an entire year of battling the pandemic, educational standards and social norms, I'm more than happy to say that our failure has actually propelled a lot of our success. And so today I'll be mentioning some of that, but I'll also be talking about the importance of acknowledgement and um, acknowledging what our next step actually is and how to, how to be an effective, compassionate leader within today's climate. Ooh. Okay, so the first thing is that I'm actually attending the University of Florida to study political science with a minor in Spanish, and I'm on the pre-law track. Again, I'm still fighting for equitable medical and educational access within our county and everything that we're doing. In fact, I had an internship this summer with our school district in order to create effective wellness programs um, that were catered towards our first generation low income employees. So I want to start by saying that we had to get to work on the bettering the legs of the Roots and Shoots Gateway High School group and ensuring that we had a smooth transition into the new academic year. And I would not have been able to do that without the help of Ms. Erdman, who's our sponsor, Dana, and the new um, Roots and Shoots staff there. And so with that, we actually were able to create six new projects within one school year. And that leads us to have a total of nine projects within the past two years. We've had over 60 members where one third of the members were constantly participating in projects, going to school and volunteering in our opportunities and biweekly meetings. We raised over $965 in which 850 came from the period organization, which funded our Osceola Women's Wellness Project to promote menstrual hygiene and equity. And of course, um, we had over 560 supporters of our Awesome Women's Wellness Project to bring pads and tampons into school bathrooms while promoting um, feminine hygiene and menstrual equity. So we've had quite a few projects within the past year. Um, the first thing was that we conducted a campus cleanup with the attendance of over 40 people after collaborating with other clubs on campus. Um, the Oscar Women's Wellness Project is something that you'll always hear me talking about, and I'm sure the council members have heard this story a thousand times, but basically we created a robust system to ensure that pads and tampons are distributed across campus. Sadly, I wasn't there to see it in action, but Dana has actually been following through, and I'm so proud of her and what Gateway has become. And the pilot program is actually running now, and we use that money that we earned from the grant to purchase over 2,000 pads and tampons for, throughout the school year. We also created a female hygiene assistance program where students could request portions of donations and other things to be at their fingertips just in case they needed the resources outside of school, as well as creating an online resource guide for them just in case their family needed some extra help. And this project was essentially what led to the legitimization of the Roots and Shoots chapter at Gateway. Mm -hmm. And of course the school district because it, the school district and I have had a few battles um, regarding what we were doing. Um, another project that we did was the Just One Thing initiative. So it's a digital form where students were able to make their promise to the earth. And although we didn't receive many, receive many promises, it was an honest and um, easy way to get students encouraged to make environmental change within their own homes, whether it be starting their own garden or even starting their own recycling um, system. Because in Kissimmee, we've actually just started recycling recently, like within the past five to 10 years. So that's something that um, we should all be aware of. Um, and as uh, Dana had mentioned, we did have events called monthly mindfulness and speaker series that were aiming to bring resources virtually to the students. So we held five presentations that varied from therapists to the CEO of an LLC that designs space houses. So we've had a variety of opportunities for students to learn about many of our issues mm. and many different things that we have in our world. And of course, we had the Make Your Mark Art Gallery, which was hosted at a local elementary school. 
Um, we had many students participate and we raised $60 mm -hmm. in which 100% of the proceeds went to the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project to help bring um, the outside world or like the natural land access to border communities. And so one thing I do wanna mention there is that because we are a low income community, any money was a good donation. And we were actually really surprised that we earned $60. And again, personally, like I've been working um, on open enrollment and wellness programs for the school district employees. And so that's what I've been doing this summer and hopefully I'll be able to continue doing more throughout my college life. So I did wanna bring attention to what it meant to be a compassionate leader. Um, I would like to use a platform that was provided to me, of course, by the JJ and Roots and Shoots to bring attention to a larger umbrella of issues that can hopefully impact youth leaders and kind of the projects that we create. So as you can see here, I have a list of all the traits that classify um, a compassionate leader. And one of the bigger things to me is recognizing the difference between acknowledgement and acceptance. And they're, they're actually very synonymous and it was an actually very complicated mm -hmm. um, thing to look into, but it's something that we need to discuss. And so with acknowledgement, we commonly associate that with recognition and acceptance, we, um, we uh, recognize that as belief. And so although our group at Roots and Shoots was able to complete a ton of work, I feel like our biggest struggle was to really look at the root causes of a lot of our issues. A lot of the issues caused here are based on poverty. And so we need to make sure that our projects actually targeted that. And a perfect example was the Oslo Women's Wellness Project that was also had the Female Hygiene Assistance Program to ensure that we addressed, oh, sorry, we addressed poverty and other issues within our community. So in first generation low income and majority minority spaces, we have to, we often ignore the issue of acknowledgement versus acceptance. So as I was saying before, acknowledgement is to recognize. So noticing an issue that it exists. Yes, it's there. We acknowledge that issue. However, accepting an issue is also taking it to that next step and making sure that we create um, procedures and projects that are effective um, that will lead to greater participation and awareness within our communities. So to be a compassionate leader is not only to understand how we can get our communities to accept an issue, but to acknowledge an issue and promote better programs. Something that I learned throughout my internship was with health related issues, we have enough programs in the world right now. We have enough programs battling diabetes. We have a lot of programs battling different health issues, especially in um, the field of social justice and things. However, a big step back is not having good outreach, not having good community engagement and not being able to accept whatever the next step is. And so we see that with menstrual equity, inequity, lack of educational resources, limited creative spaces, they all stem from a root issue. And we have to address that root issue in order to um, create effective projects. So again, as I was saying, as compassionate leaders, we can't create projects that simply touch the surface of those issues. We need to accept the root issues um, that are primarily systemic, which will lead us to create planned, thoroughly planned and evaluated projects that target systemic damage within our communities that disproportionately, unfortunately, affect minority communities and immigrant families and households. And this is especially important to do because everything we have now it has become politicized, whether it be our health or education. Um, in fact, a lot of House bills have passed in Florida regarding education systems and how we stand during the first minute in our announcements. But uh, that's a different topic for a different um, for a different presentation. So basically what I wanted to get down to was what's the next step. So for all youth leaders, including myself, it's to create effective projects that demobilize root causes. Um, again, in perfect example was something that we created at Gateway, which also needs touch ups, a lot of touch ups, but um, promoting female hygiene in school campuses while also creating outside resources and um, financial resources for students and families alike that target systemic issues like poverty. The next thing would be to educate yourself and others on systemic issues. This goes back to the four step formula that we have at the JGN Roots and Shoots to prompt projects even created within the community. Um, and this is something that I said last year, a big thing that fourth step is to celebrate, but I think it, we really need to reflect on our projects and their effectiveness and how we can continue to grow as people, as humans and as activists and compassionate leaders. And lastly, the next step is you, and of course, in my case, me, to continue promoting change, educating yourself on acknowledgement and awareness and staying true to your values, because those really are important um, within creating yourself as a youth leader and promoting projects that are effective, productive, and essential to your community. So thank you.
You're amazing, amazing projects again, and loved hearing you describe um, the leadership traits and how to work those into to the work that you're doing. And it's just extraordinary. Um, thank you too for the mentorship that you're providing within Roots and Shoots and, and bringing up those behind you and, and reaching out into the broader community of Roots and Shoots. So thank you for your presentation. And I can't believe that we're here. I'm looking at the list now and Gabby, my goodness, you're bringing it home for us. So Gabby, <laughs> the stage is yours. Great. Um, let me just present really quickly. Cool. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Looks great. great. Um, so hi, everyone. I know we've had a really long day of presentations, but hang with me for a couple more minutes because I'm super excited to get into some of my work with you guys this evening. Um, and this picture to the right is of my Roots and Shoots group at my high school. So let's get started. Okay. So hi, my name is Gabby. Um, I'm a rising freshman in college and I'll be studying chemistry. And I've been a Roots and Shoots member for four years, ever since my freshman year in high school. And it's my second year on the NYLC. And that's a picture of me to the right. Um, during high school, besides Roots and Shoots, I was also involved in choir, my school's literary magazine, piano, amongst other things. And I definitely want to continue to carry on these things as I further my education in college. Um, some fun facts about me are that I was born in Venezuela, I've lived on three continents, and I have an older sister. So first, I really wanted to get into my service targets with you guys um, really briefly, and these are some of the areas that my Roots and Shoots group addressed within our projects before my graduation. Um, I won't have time to go over all the projects under every category, but I can introduce them quickly. So the first is income inequality. I live in a neighborhood that is very affluent, but there is a large disparity um, in income amongst its residents. And so within this category, we've done our Thanksgiving food drive, which is a huge annual event. There's a picture of it to the right where we're assembling boxes. Um, and essentially, it's a big food drive where we assemble over 100 boxes for over 100 families in my area who aren't able to afford a Thanksgiving meal. And I talked to you guys about this topic last year, and although it's annual, I kind of wanted to talk about a few different things this year. But if you're interested in that, I highly recommend checking out last year's live stream presentation. Um, but under this category, we also have the 9-11 food drive that my school does, where we collect one can for every life lost during 9-11. Next, we have environmental issues. So under this box, we have a plastic art challenge, which I'll get into a little bit later, and beach cleanups. Um, we have a town beach where we go to for these events. And it's a very low key event. We get breakfast for our volunteers and spread out across the area. And we have a lot of fun. Um, a couple of years ago, we also worked to ban plastic bags in my town, um, which is something that was you know, super inspiring and definitely made a lot of impact within my neighborhood, especially. Um, for animal well-being, our club members have assisted at adoption events, animal adoption events, and have baked and donated dog treats to local shelters. And these are some of our most fun events, especially the adoption events, because there are always a bunch of puppies and older dogs around. Um, and we actually use our baking days as a club bonding event um, because we put on music and we just have a good time in the kitchens. And lastly, we have education, where we've hosted Roots and Shoots leadership training seminars and have hosted a Say Something Week of Events, which it promotes anti-bullying and peer awareness in honor of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, which occurred not, not far from where I live. Um, and this week can be filled with daily events that promote unity within our student body. Um, most notably, we have a hand tree that we create, where it's a tree made out of handprints, and each hand has something that you're thankful for written inside of it, and that's something that's super fun to create, and we look forward to it every year. So now we're going to get into our first project breakdown, which was a library book drive that we did. So this is essentially how it worked. Um, this event took place during Say Something Week. Um, March 2nd is actually Read Across America Day, so we wanted to create something um, kind of inspired by that. 
Um, so as a result, our My Roots and Shoots Club sponsored a week-long book drive event as its culminating event, and we have a flyer there to the right. Um, since we couldn't collect books in person this year due to COVID restrictions, we created a virtual fundraiser whose goal was to raise $3,500. And the money would be raised to go towards buying book bundles to donate to the 11 elementary schools in my town. Luckily, we did reach this goal and we were able to buy each of the 11 elementary schools 200 new books um, and then they were delivered. And the schools were so thankful for these new resources and we were happy to help. Um, one of our challenges during this project actually ended up being a Thanksgiving food drive because we actually ended up raising $20,000 for it, which is amazing and so proud of it, but we just weren't sure if people were gonna be able or willing to help out. Um, but something that worked in our favor was that we were supporting our elementary schools and it would impact residents' kids and everything. So people really did want to help. And next we have the Plastic Art Challenge. Um, it's the last project I'll go over in depth, but it's, it's super, con super fun and it was a simpler concept. Um, oops. Uh, so we drew inspiration from the Roots and Shoots 30th anniversary event because one of the themes was plastic pollution. And so my chapter kind of responded to this project. Um, so in order to reduce plastic pollution in my community, our club encouraged students to reuse ordinary household plastic, like plastic water bottles, and create something unique out of them. Um, we wanted them to think creatively and out of the box. And we spread the word. Um, by creating a Google form for submissions and flyers. This is kind of step two is to get it out there. Um, and then step three, we were, you know, anxiously waiting for submissions so we could later vote for winners. We did win some really cool prizes. Uh, we chose a first, second, and third place winner. And it was really cool seeing how into it people got and kind of bridging that gap, as many people have said, between environmentalism and art. And seeing people just motivated to do something simpler, take on something, a, a creative project after school. So here we have the second and third place winners. Unfortunately, I'm not able to use the first place winners pictures because the person's face is in it. But to the left, we have a really cool waterfall. This is like one of the coolest projects I've personally seen. Um, I'm not even sure what they use to make all of it, but you can see water bottle trees definitely. Um, and then on the right, we have a muffin container being reused into a planter. You can see the dirt and they you know, painted it and are planting seeds. Um, and so this was really, really fun. And I highly recommend this project. We kind of discovered it um, because we wanted to participate in the 30th anniversary event, but we weren't sure what to do because of COVID. We couldn't really do things in person, um, but I'm really, really glad that we took this on. Um, and so that's a wrap. I'm sure I talked for a little bit for a long time, but I just wanted to say that I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of the NYLC and I've learned so many things from them. One of the biggest being resilience. So, you know, to be able to maintain this passion and this perseverance, especially during COVID, where we've all faced a lot of difficulties is incredible and I'm very, very proud of everyone. Um, and I'm glad to kind of end off this event. Um, so thank you for hearing me out and for listening to my presentation. What a great presentation and what a high note to end on, Gabby. Thank you so much for that. Um, and sharing with us your stories, sharing with us your work. Um, I'm struck by the amount of compassion and creativity and innovation that you and many other roots and shootsers are bringing to their projects and in your approach to the world and, and your future. It's just extraordinary and so, so inspiring. So well done. Thank you. Keep up the great work. And we look forward to hearing much more in the years to come. Well, that brings us to the end of our program here um, today. And again, <clears throat> just to reflect back on the projects and programs and approaches that were shared by all of you, um, I hope you feel very proud of yourselves. Um, it's extraordinary what you are doing. We talked a lot about hope um, throughout this, and you are the reason for hope because of your approach to how you view challenges and then meet them with optimism, with creativity, with innovation, and bringing people along with you. So well done. Congratulations. 
and here's to much more. Um, <clears throat> with that, we have a message, a special message here. So from Jane herself. So I'll let the team take it over to that. When people were coming from around Dar es Salaam or around another city or from around the whole of Tanzania, The young people were saying, together we can, in other words, we can save the world. And I said, yes, we can. We know how to do it, but will we? Will we all get involved? Will we all do our bit? Will we remember that every single day we make a difference? So now, At the end of our gatherings, everybody says, together we can, together we will. And that's what I'm encouraging. Roots and Shoots groups to do at the end of a meeting. And in fact, I encourage when I was speaking to large, large audiences, everybody to stand up and join me in saying together we can save the world and together we will save the world and that's the message i have for you now together we can together we together we can together we will